Are you ready for your next great Civil War read? Then try the new historical novel, The Heavens Falling, by Jonathan Lucci. Follow the members of the Dawson family through the Civil War, from the halls of Congress to the bloody fields of battle, and from the decks of gunboats to the solitude of Lincoln's office. The Heavens Falling is available on Amazon in paperback and Kindle, or visit theheavensfalling.com to order. That's theheavensfalling.com. This episode of Addressing Gettysburg is brought to you in part by me. Audiobook narrator, Mike Scott. Narrator of Savas Beattie's Bloody Autumn, the Shenandoah Valley Campaign of 1864. And, unlike anything that ever floated, The Monitor and Virginia and the Battle of Hampton Roads. If you are an author or publisher interested in having your titles produced as audiobooks, or even just in learning more about the process, give me a shout. You can find my contact info on my website, mikescottvoice.com. That's mikescottvoice.com. Com. Enjoy historical stories on the History Fix platform. Explore movies, short films, and documentaries. Addressing Gettysburg podcast fans receive an extra $5 off the first year's annual subscription. Sign up at HistoryFix.com and use promo code Gettysburg. Every subscription includes a seven-day risk-free trial. Escape into history with History Fix. Want the freshest cup of coffee in Gettysburg? Then visit Bantam Roasters, formerly 82 Cafe at 82 Steinware Avenue. They roast all of their coffee in-house, and they have a full coffee bar to keep you caffeinated during your trip. Visit them at www.raggededgerc.com for their menu and shipping options for all of their freshly roasted coffee. Use promo code HANCOCK for 10% off your order in the cafe. The 1863 civilians of Gettysburg were reluctant witnesses to the great battle. Join Ken Rich, the man in the red shirt, for his historic town walking tours. You could book these tours by emailing ken at gettysburgtownhistory.com. That's ken at gettysburgtownhistory.com. And when you're in town, look for the guy in the red shirt. And Civil War Trails. It's the world's largest open-air museum, and they offer over 1,300 sites across six states. Drive the Gettysburg campaign turn by turn, paddle to Frederick Douglass's birthplace, or hike to remote earthworks and artillery positions. Visit CivilWarTrails.org to request a brochure and explore their interactive map. Follow Civil War Trails and create some history of your own. Believe me, I, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I made a lot of good friends in 33 years who were unlucky like that. Yeah. The best one was a guy who shot, uh, shot himself with a, a staple gun. Industrial staple gun, and um, you know those have a rosin on them, so you got to get the rosin out, or it'll cause a, a problem. Oh, really? So the only way you can do it is to put them to sleep and take something and pry the staple out. Uh-huh. And he went back to work a week later, and his boss said, "Well, how that happened? Well, it happened just like this." And he he did it again. <laughs> no way. <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> the guy was a real rocket scientist. I, I said to him when oh I saw him, God. Yeah, didn't I just see you last week? He goes, yeah. You're listening to Addressing Gettysburg. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this episode of Addressing Gettysburg. Ask a Gettysburg Guide. Today, we are talking about uh, union officers' wounds. And, of course, it's a medical uh, episode, so we've got our buddy Rick Schrader here. Hello, Rick. How are you doing? Oh, you got to pull that mic down to your mouth there, Mike. That's how this works, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Hi, man. Like, Hi, how you doing? I'm doing great. <laughs> um, and uh, so today we're going to talk about union officers. Wounds. So where the first question I have about this before we get into them specifically is where do you find good information on people's wounds back then? Um that's a really good question, and it's it's really surprising to me. When I became a guide, and I may have said this on another podcast, I really didn't care two wits about the medical care of this battle. Um, I was an X and O, right yeah. flank, left flank guy. Right. But then I realized if I'm going to sit in the guide office and people find out what my day job was, being an orthopedic surgeon, that I probably ought to know something about it. Yeah, you're going to so be I, asked. Yeah, I dove right into learning as much as I could. And I was amazed with how much information there is out there. Um, I've got at least three bookshelves full of uh, medical uh, care in the Civil War. If I was, wow. If I was to give people one reference and— um, you've had Rob Abbott on your show. He he loves these two books. There are two books written, Medical History of Union Generals, generals, not colonels, but generals, and Medical History of Confederate uh, Generals. And it goes through their entire life and tells like what they were treated for at West Point, the injuries they sustained during the war, 
and what their cause of death was at hmm. the end. So that information is real readily um, out there. And if you want to take a deep dive, there is information available on things as, as well. We'll talk probably a lot about that. Things like Joshua Chamberlain's injury and what that mm. was like. Um, 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 John Bell Hood's injury. I think uh, I was here to talk about that. That just so, came out today, actually. Oh, did it really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Good. Uh, um, but there's a surprising amount of information out there uh, for people who are interested in this. So you mentioned Joshua Chamberlain. Um, let's get uh, let's start with him because okay. um, he has a fascinating wound. Now, now n- these wounds that we're going to be talking about are obviously in Chamberlain's case, especially are not necessarily suffered here. Correct, because his wasn't. Although the list, although everybody I else seems you, to have been here. Yeah, yeah. But we had talked about this topic, and you had mentioned Joshua Chamberlain, Matt. So I figured, well, yeah, better be prepared with that. So. Well, let's get into that sure. one there because that that one. Hoofa. <laughs> yeah. You know, Mike yeah. Lentz is also sitting here with us. Hello. Um, that that wound there sounds, I would just rather be put out of my misery. Well, it was a pretty pretty devastating wound, that's for sure. And again, this isn't an injury sustained at Gettysburg. As right. we all know, in the process of saving the United States of America, Joshua Chamberlain was uninjured here at Gettysburg. Um, but a year later, in June of 1864, in the Petersburg campaign, uh, his date of injury was 6-18-64 at Reeves or Rives Salient, um, south of Petersburg. Uh, he sustained an injury where a bullet, I believe, entered his right hip, went all the way across his pelvis, through his bladder, through his urethra, which is the tube that connects the bladder to where your urine comes out of, whether you're male or female. Right. Um, and then lodged under the skin on the left side of the pelvis. So he sustained bony injuries and urologic or organ injuries that were devastating. And he so, really should have died from it. Right. So let me ask you this. Uh, from a modern medical perspective, how difficult would it be to repair a man receiving that wound? It still would be difficult. Um but, and with that's with all the technology we have today. Yeah. Um, the bone injuries can be taken care of. Bones tend to heal themselves, which is why I like being an orthopedic surgeon. <laughs> Less but, work for they, you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, it worked out okay in the vast majority of people. Even, in a, and I'm an orthopedic surgeon, so I'm not a urologist. So right. bladder injuries and urethral injuries aren't my area of expertise. But I did take care of... Uh, people in conjunction with urologists because of pelvic injuries. Uh, bladder injuries are not that hard to take care of. It's The bladder's a pretty, a pretty resilient organ. It's basically, a, 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 depending on how much urine is in it, it's anywhere from a pear to a, a small basketball in size. But the problem is the tube that connects the bladder to the external um, uh, world, uh, the uh, the end of your urethra where you pee. And obviously in men, that's longer because it goes out through the penis. In women, it's shorter because as the, I think everybody yeah. listening knows we women all, don't have penises. People, right. <laughs> exactly. Right. Yeah. Um, and that, that's just clinical. But the, the problem is um, the urethra, when it's injured, um, likes to heal quickly. And if the tube isn't maintained, it's going to close off, and now it's going to open somewhere else oh. in what's called a fistula, where the urine is now going to come out of a hole that isn't the hole that it was supposed to come and out of. Probably, in, it was, so it would come out internally. Um, it no, would, it, right? it'll find its way to the external environment, and you'll be losing urine out of a hole at the base of your penis or oh, underneath Jesus. your scrotum. What a or, freak show. Yeah, uh, fistulas are a connection between the internal body cavities and the external environment. So is that like if you have a, a cyst and it starts to leak and it, and, it, and it comes to a head and makes, is that a fistula when it comes to a head it like prob- that? A, a cyst like that only has one opening. A fistula has an internal and an external opening. Okay. So if you get a fistula in your bowel, you can lose... Um, intestinal contents or stool um, out through an opening in the skin. Some people with what's called inflammatory bowel disease or Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis can actually develop those. That's true. Yeah. It's pretty pretty difficult. And and 
going along with any injury to the urethra and the penis, of course, um, the other purposes of the penis that don't have to do with um, with getting yeah. rid of urine, sexual function is almost always badly impaired. And that's, that's so. obviously a stressor for a young man who's uh, suffered this injury and now has a whole life ahead of him. Yeah. And that was a problem for Joshua Chambers. Well, and that's why I would say just put me out of my misery. Just <laughs> end it right now. So what what did they do? How did they, how did they fix him? Well, um, he had, over the course of his lifetime, he had three or four major surgeries. The initial surgery was to put a catheter in. I mean, most people are familiar with that um, device that would go in through the urethra into the bladder and hopefully serve as a stent that it would heal around. But then mm. when the, the, the catheter is taken out, one will quickly find out whether it healed correctly or not, because if urine comes out at the end of the urethra, at the end of the penis, then it worked. Um, now, if it doesn't scar off and now divert the urine to another uh, location where it's coming out of a new fistula, um, then it will. that function will work. Whether the other functions we alluded to in terms of sexual activity may never work again, even if you're peeing in, in the correct fashion. Right. Um, so when, when, when the bullet went in, like, I mean, it had to have hit bone, it did. right, in his pelvis and yeah, everything? Yeah. So, but they were able to, what, just kind of glue it back together? Like, how, no, did, how they, would they have done that back they then? They wouldn't have done anything with the bony injuries. They um, just would have let yeah. it heal. And when you read his post-war accounts, he does have difficulty walking because of hip problems. Oh, I'm um, sure he does. I'm not sure exactly where in the bony pelvis the bullet went. I don't know if it went through the hip joint or it it. it it probably did not destroy one or both hip joints, or he wouldn't have been able to walk. Mm. But it could. Have, the pelvis is a big bone. It can go through the pelvis, inside the bladder, outside the bladder, yeah, through and, the other side uh, of the pelvis. God. So I, I think I heard that they used the, a glass tube to reconnect the— Yeah, the, the, the catheters weren't always soft plastic things like— like we have nowadays. They, they didn't use, have plastic. No. No. So they, yeah, they use glass or they use metal. Um, and Imagine like you fall down and you break your glass yeah. urethra. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. now you got like broken glass. Oh, uh, my yeah. God. Up just, in there. It goes from bad to worse. Me. Just <laughs> end it. Bad to worse. Oh, so, okay. So, so he's got a glass urethra. Go ahead. And um, as I said, the catheter is taken out. Um, but it's clear. And, and there's a couple of really good articles written on this. Um, I actually have one book with me here. I know we're not on video, but there's a chapter in this book uh, entitled Bodies in Blue, Disability in the Civil War North by an author by the name of Sarah Handley Cousins that is just about Joshua Chamberlain's injury. And it goes into great detail about uh, at the time and then later on. And... This book is about disability and disabling injuries that you can't see. Mm. Everybody can see an empty sleeve. Mm -hmm. But the vast, vast majority of people injured in the Civil War had injuries you couldn't see. And that includes a topic that we've talked about before with war trauma and PTSD. PTSD, Right. But Joshua Chamberlain is a good example of someone who's a hero. He goes on to be the governor of a state, the president of a college. And he doesn't have a wound you can see, but he's got a a horrific disabling wound. Mm. And one of the common things that people talk about with these type of injuries, and it doesn't take a great deal of imagination to realize, is the odor that these men have about their bodies. They smell like urine. They smell like they peed their pants because they have. Because they have. Yeah, they can't control when the urine comes out. They just leak urine. (sighs) Man, that is – I mean, and and he – was very public yes. for the rest of his life. Right. So I mean, that I mean, the guy was the the, the he has a he had a strong mind. Yes, he certainly <laughs> did. It's very interesting when you get into the specifics of this. Though he's no more immune to life stresses than any other person would be, because as you can imagine, he and Fanny's relationship becomes pretty stormy after this. Yeah. And she actually accuses him of physical abuse. And, and wants a divorce. Really? And uh, oh. he writes about how if she wants a divorce, he'll give her a divorce, but they reconciled. But in the last 20, 25 years of their marriage, they often weren't together. 
Um, she would leave when he would come home from the governor's mansion, but they uh, they had a a, a very rocky relationship uh-huh. in the in the last twenty five to thirty years. It's a years. far cry from that long, beautiful, loving conversation they had before he went off to war. Yeah, very different relationship, or at least as depicted in Gods and Generals. Right, um, <laughs> but yeah, a very different relationship after after that, and. Gosh, you can't expect really anything else who sustains um, what they had before afterwards. They can't. Well, not with a, a, a defective penis. Yeah, no, and of course not. like yeah. urine all the time. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Oh. But how, she, how could she? She could hardly blame him for that. What? Well, it's not his fault he smelled like urine. No. 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 It just, it's not but his who wants fault to be around other than if anyway. he'd gone on sabbatical like Bowden College wanted, right. none of this would have happened. Right, right. If you, yeah, that's true. If you had just stayed in your lane, Josh. Right, right. Um, all right, so then let's see some of the other ones. So let's go. I'll get some of the famous ones out of the way here. Uh, now, this, these are <coughs> Gettysburg people, obviously. Um, let's stick on Little Round Top for a second. Patty O'Rourke. Patty O'Rourke, sure. Poor Patty. One of the one of the lesser known, but I, I think um, very prominent hero. We had a lot of heroes in Little Round Top. There's a sign that says "One Savior." I think there's three or four people up there that can wear yeah, that. Wear that uh, I agree. That sign. Patty O'Rourke leads his. 140th New York up in the nick of time uh, with their guns unloaded and a bayonet charge down the face of Little Round Top. And he is, um, he leads his men uh, down over the crest as, um, as, and maybe we'll get to him as Strong Vincent's brigade is collapsing a little bit on the right. That gap is filled by the 140th. And as, as O'Rourke is leading them down, he's shot through the neck. And it appears when you read about his injury that he was killed pretty quickly. So that would mean to me that he sustained an injury to the blood vessels in his neck and bled to death. If he if he was shot through the throat and didn't bleed to death, it would have taken a day or two or more for him to die. But he died quite quickly. So I think his injury was pretty severe. Um, uh, I can't remember... If he died in a hospital or if he died on the hill, I would have to revisit that. Mike, do you know any of that? I think he might have died on the hill. That's my th- yeah. thinking, yeah. So that tells me, again, this was a pretty instantaneous death, meaning it, it, it hit the big vessels in his neck, his carotid artery, his jugular vein. That's that. So you would you would bleed out, yeah. obviously, but also you probably would be drowning on your blood, too. Yeah, You'd exactly. You'd be inhaling a lot yeah. of that. Yeah. Ugh, yeah. What, a, what a horrible thing. Yeah. Um, all right, so... Uh, he doesn't last long. There's no, is there any uh, like autopsy done on him or any any kind of report? I mean, w- or do we know this just because guys near him said he was hit in the neck, or um, is there a report? Yeah, the, I think when you look at the reports, I think Porter Farley is the guy whose name comes to mind that wrote a lot about the 140th. He describes his injury as being pretty severe right there. I'm not sure if there was a, a medical report with a surgeon's diagram. Right. Probably not um, if he was dead quite quickly. Yeah. Uh, all right. How about, uh, oh, John Reynolds, the big old John Reynolds. Yeah. So go back another day from a Little Round Top to John Reynolds. John Reynolds is an interesting topic. In I practiced in Johnstown, Pennsylvania for 33 years, and there's a connection to John Reynolds and the Johnstown area that most people aren't aware of. Hmm. So John Reynolds arrives again. I think the theme of this battle, in many instances, could be in the nick of time. Mm, John yeah. Reynolds arrives with with uh, a division of his first corps, about three thousand soldiers, in the nick of time, and and goes uh, with half of them into Herb's Woods, uh, the Iron Brigade, uh, leading the Iron Brigade into the woods. Um, you can argue whether that's good leadership or bad leadership, but it cost him his life. And when you read about Reynolds' death, it's it's uh, recounted in a couple of different ways. I have read that he was shot in the head and was dead by the time he hit the ground. Mm-hmm. I have read that he was shot in the back of the neck and and gave one sigh and then died. But his um, his sergeant, who I believe was his assistant, whose arms he fell into, was a guy by the name of Charles Vail, V E I L. And he was from a small town near Johnstown, uh, an area um, uh, called um, 
uh, uh, Paint Creek. It's, now there's a little town there called Winber, but he was a school teacher just out right side, outside of Johnstown. And Reynolds' family was so grateful to Vale getting uh, the general's body off of the battlefield. They had a connection to Stanton. And they went to Stanton, and Stanton promoted Vale to being an officer in the cavalry. And, and, and then he moved out to Arizona and ends up coming back to the Johnstown area. But Charles Vale was his orderly who took his body off the battlefield. But you read that, that Reynolds was shot by a, a, a sharpshooter. Mm. I don't know that anybody has ever really uh, proven that. Uh, but uh, it, I think— Either injury could be consistent with an in, almost an instantaneous death. If you're shot in the head, obviously, and if you're shot in the the upper neck, it's in essence the same as really being shot in the head. My uh, my friend's brother was murdered twenty um, something years ago, maybe almost thirty now, and um, he he was hit at the base um, of the skull in the back and out like a light. Yeah. Like, you know, very instantaneous. I mean, if you if you read about executions and war atrocities, that's a pretty common way to ensure people are dead with one shot. Yeah. Um, so he, yeah, and then the, the um, fall to the ground or dead before he hit the ground is a very common thing. Like, uh, you could walk across the field without ever touching the ground. There were so many bodies. That was... Uh, like the uh, wheat field. Yeah. Yeah. But you hear that a lot. Yeah. You know uh, ways to describe things, and and I often wondered because uh, I remember I was I was telling the story. My cousin was visiting here with her kids, and I told a few stories, and I think I had used the phrase "dead before he hit the ground" a couple times, and she goes. Geez, a lot of people are dying so quickly that they don't even have time to hit the ground. And I was like, yeah, you know what? I wonder if that was just one of those little cliches it that they be. used yeah, back it then. It might be. But yeah. I think it denotes the obvious that this it is a like wound a, that you're not going to survive right. more than a second or two. Yeah. Right. Um, okay. So uh, there's Reynolds there. Let's see. Who else should we go to? How about – oh, yes. So I, I often – and I probably shouldn't, but make a joke about, uh, you know, Willard losing his head. Oh. Um, that's yeah. not nice. I shouldn't do that. Yeah, George Willard. Um, I think most people who come to this battlefield know the story of the first Minnesota. But what gets lost in that is the contribution of, of George Willard's brigade. Because yeah. uh, the first Minnesota uh, gave a great deal on the battlefield, but so did um Three of those four regiments in, in Willard's Brigade mm-hmm. did basically the same thing. Um, they basically um, gotten done with their fighting, and they're ready to start going back. And that's when Willard is struck in the face or the head by an artillery fragment. And it's devastating. It's supposedly such a devastating wound that his staff cover his face with a blanket so the men can't see it. Mm. That uh, I'm envisioning like, you know, half of his face was ripped off. That's what I'm thinking, right. yeah. Right, and Ugh. then, of course, he's succeeded in command by Eliakim Sherrill, who then gets in trouble because Sherrill goes back to where they started because he thought that's what he was supposed to do. Right. And—, and General Hancock, who is the MVP of the battle for the Union Army, there's no doubt about it, but still had a pretty short temper, <laughs> didn't like that these guys were leaving the battlefield as he saw it. So he places Eliakim Sherrill under arrest, which only thickens the whole plot between the Willard Sherrill, um, uh, uh, West Virginia cowards. Uh, um, Harper's Ferry cowards, Harper, yeah. Yeah, Harper's Ferry yeah. cowards. So. Well, yeah, so now you mentioned Sherrill, so now going to him because he gets wounded. He does get wounded. He's under arrest, but um, a couple of the men in the brigade go to Hancock and say, you were mistaken. You were mistaken, and and you don't understand. And so Cheryl was released from arrest and put back in command, and he's um, commanding up near Ziegler's Grove on July 3rd during Pickett's Charge when he is um, uh, mortally wounded when he's shot in the abdomen. And um, he had already sustained a pretty devastating injury in the battle at Harper's Ferry in 1862, where part of his jaw was shot. And it took months and months for that to heal. And it kept, uh, he had a wound that kept reopening and reopening until finally a surgeon looked into his mouth and saw that he still had a tooth 
buried in his tongue. And the presence of the tooth kept causing an infection. Oh. So once they got the tooth out of there, his wound healed. But he already had sustained a pretty significant <laughs> facial injury. But he was he was shot in the abdomen. And in and, and, and some of the talks that my buddy Fran Fiak and I have done, we've made the point, if you're shot in the abdomen, there's a 98% chance you're going to die. Yeah. Because there are no antibiotics. There's no safe way to proceed with surgery on the abdominal cavity. And so if you're shot in the uh, abdomen, you're not going to survive that. And he's taken to the Spangler barn, the George Spangler uh, farm, where he where he does die. I mean, being shot in the abdomen, I mean, everything's in there. Yeah. All the, you know, I mean, and you need all that yeah. stuff. So it's like it, today, if you're shot in the abdomen, let's say you're shot... And it goes through your stomach. Uh-huh. And I mean the organ, not yeah. just what we call the, the stomach, stomach, right? Right, right. Um, I, I, so, I, I, of course, I don't, this is how my, <laughs> my brain works. I, I am not a medical expert, so I don't know how everything in the body works. But I'm imagining, like, you're getting some stomach acid leaking out. Stomach acid and... It's got to burn. The problem in the abdomen is that uh, what's inside your digestive tract is not sterile. It's got bugs in it. And so if you're shot through the no, stomach. I'm never eating again. Um, what are you talking you're about? You're going to get acid, but you're also going to get, there's bacteria that live in your stomach. And oh, course, oh, yeah, if yeah, If you're yeah. shot through the colon, and Mike has a near and dear recent uh, yes, experience, yes. thank goodness, and, yeah. with good news. Um, you got shot in the colon. Yeah, so there are going to be, the, <laughs> yeah, in some ways, yeah. Is, um, yeah, video shot. It's yeah, a yes. video shot. Um, but... The in modern medicine, the surgery that's done is to divert um, the intestinal stream from the area of the injury so it can heal. So that means if it's lower in the bowel, a colostomy is done so that stool isn't passing through the injured area and it can heal. So mm. people will the the trauma surgeons. That's not what I did. These are general surgeons who do abdominal surgery with a specialty in trauma. Victims, shootings, car accidents, false industrial falls from height. They're the ones who, who take care of those life-threatening injuries. Is it fair to say that uh, the fact that we have trauma surgeons who are experienced with bullet wounds, um, a good deal of that knowledge that they've uh, that's been built on that they now practice uh, comes from what our doctors learned during the Civil oh, absolutely. War. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think. Maybe not so much the how am I going to keep you alive today, tomorrow, and the next day, right? but how, how are we going to make the decision on what we need to do? And that all goes back to Letterman's triage system here, which I can never say enough about yeah. in terms of how important it is. And that guy needs to have some kind of monument or something to him here. Yeah. Like, I mean, to him specifically. Yeah, yeah. Or somewhere. Well, I mean, I'm sure there is you know, somewhere. There, but There's a whole plot of ground out on Route 30 to the east with uh, that was Camp Letterman that yeah. – from what I understand, a, a grocery store is going to finally be built on. So. Grocery store or condos? I, no, I thought it was, it was condos. condos. Now, recently, I heard one of our fellow guides say he got a bid for a sign for an Aldi's out there. Oh. But, 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 we have plenty of grocery stores. <laughs> Can we just keep... <laughs> well, I can't, yeah. I just, I'm amazed the field has stayed open as long as it has, <laughs> yeah. Listen, given where it is. I hate, to, I hate to sound like I'm in the club, so now no one can come in and close the door, but... Uh, the, we, we keep getting people moving here. Yeah, this stuff is gonna all be gone. Yeah, it's yeah. gonna be gone. Like you're just gonna Camp Letterman is. Yeah, I mean that's been under threat. I mean the giant that's out there now, and a lot of those other buildings that are there, Michaels and all that stuff. They're all on Camp, Camp Letterman, Letterman property yeah. anyway, so right. it's already mostly gone. About fifty percent of it's gone. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but you know, geez, we can't hold one little field. Yeah. You know, we got a little stone marker there, but that's about it. Mike, uh, going back to Elikam Cheryl mm -hmm. and his wounding, uh, but his wounding at Harper's Ferry. Um, <clears throat> after he was wounded at Harper's Ferry, his regiment almost went to pieces. Yeah. After that. Yeah. I've seen in sources that when Willard is struck, it's Cheryl who takes control and says, cover his face with a blanket. We don't want the men seeing this. That may well be. I mean, Elikam Cheryl was a very... Um Take charge, leader. It was clear right from uh, the inception that that he was he was um, a guy who was born to be a leader. Which um, you know, there's a pretty famous quote um, from Alexander Hayes about Eliakim Sherrill and him being arrested. Uh, Hayes and and Hancock were talking after the Battle of Gettysburg. Um, 
and let me, I'll just read this quote because I think it's revealing. In the process, the issue of Hancock's arrest of Colonel Eliakim Sherrill came up. And perhaps realizing he had been a little too hasty that day, Hancock sheepishly asked Hayes, what has become of the colonel of your division I put in arrest at, at Gettysburg? Probably finding it difficult not to explode in front of his superior, Hayes nonetheless <laughs> erupted with, that's just like all of your damned apologies, Hancock. They come too late. He's dead. <laughs> and which was interesting because um, Hancock outranked Hayes, but Hayes was five or six years older than Hancock. And Alexander Hayes had a relationship with these guys oh, because yeah. he, he was the one that took over charge of that brigade when it was first formed in the defenses of Washington. Right. He's the one that actually gave it its spirit, gave it its morale back. Right. Okay. To do the very thing that they did here at Gettysburg. Exactly. No, that's exactly right, Mike. That's uh, Mike Lentz, future licensed battlefield guy, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. And that's the way it should be. Yeah. Um, all right. Now... Let's go on to the third guy in this little love triangle that we're talking about here. Winnie Boy, old Winnie Boy, <laughs> Winfield Scott Hancock. Yeah. What do we have? Well, he is, as I said earlier. Because his wound is yeah, ghastly. It, it's very interesting. I, I think Chamberlain gets the ghastliest wound myself. Oh, I do too, but this but, is a pretty close yeah, this second. Is, this is pretty bad. So <laughs> Hancock, as I said, and I do believe this, is the MVP for the Union Army at Gettysburg. His best three days of being a general. Brand new corps commander. I mean, he, he's really never commanded at this level. Um, he, he does absolutely crucial things on all three days of the battle. People should never forget what he did on day one to rally yeah. the uh, Union Army up on Cemetery Hill. Well, yeah, you make. let's not uh, blow past this because you make a good point. So at Chancellorsville... He's under Couch, right? That's correct. Couch was so, in command of the Second Corps. Yeah. So this is his first battle as a Corps commander. Yep. And on the first day of the battle, the Army commander takes this new Corps commander and says, go up ahead and see if we should fight here, what the situation is, et cetera, et cetera. And he goes up and, and as you say, you know, rallies everybody. And, and, yeah. And, and, and that's uh, why his, I think, and I've heard people as, as important as Ed Bars say this, his statue's on East Cemetery Hill for a reason. Yeah. It's not along uh, Cemetery Ridge. And his his hand, the way it's positioned, exactly. it's like, calm down, right. like, just right. relax. We're, uh, you know, daddy's here. <laughs> as, as opposed to the other equestrian statue up there of, uh, oh, Howard, who is, uh, horse is kind of looking around <laughs> nervously, like, yeah, what are we yeah. going to do? <laughs> Sorry if I, if I made light of that. No, but just still. Yeah. Um, but it, it, does, it does stand out, because, yeah. I mean, I think I'm thinking of all the other equestrian statues. None of them are really. Are they gesturing with their hands at all? I think he's the only one, right? No, uh, I'd have to think. And to think. What is Reynolds doing with his hands? I, th I think he's holding sure. the reins. Yeah, with both hands. And Meade is holding the reins. I yeah, think. yeah. Meade is. So is Sedgwick. So is Slocum. Uh huh. Yeah. And, of course, Howard only has one arm to hold. Right. Him. So he's holding the reins with his teeth and waving with the other right. arm. Going glove shopping with Phil Carney. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Saving money. <laughs> uh, yeah. What's movie? What, there's a movie um, where, but it's like, it takes place after the Civil War, but they're talking about how their his granddaddy's met. Uh, because they're both in the war. One oh. lost his left oh. leg. One lost his right You're leg. You're talking about uh, Galloway of We Were Soldiers. That's what it was. The, yes. The, yes. The journalist. Yes. Yeah. Did I tell you I went to, this is nothing. We're so off track here. But I went to college <laughs> with his uh, son, Joseph oh, really? Galloway's son. And uh, <clears throat> it was, it was I, I, I saw him in the hallway and I said, hey, Josh, what's going on? I think his name was Josh. I said, what's going on with you? And he's like, oh, nothing. I just got a phone with my dad. And I go, yeah, what's new with him? And he's like. Oh, he's down in South Carolina meeting with Mel Gibson. I was like, wait, what? <laughs> and he's like, yeah, he's, I don't know. He wrote some book about his time in Vietnam, and Mel Gibson's making a movie out of it. And I'm like, you're full of shit. And he's like, no, I swear to God. And he's like, it's called We Were Soldiers Once and Young. And I was like, I've never heard of it. And uh, then like a year and a half later, We Were Soldiers came out. Yep. And I was like, holy crap. Yeah. That's so That's cool. cool. Yeah. yeah. Should have stayed in touch, but whatever. Could have got some of that Galloway money. <laughs> <laughs> you know, oh, June Besson's. Okay, so anyway, so go ahead. Yeah, so, Hancock. Well, Hancock. yeah, Hancock. That's where we were. That's where we were. Um, 
So on July 3rd, we talked about how strong his performance was on all days. On July 3rd, he's ridden down Cemetery Ridge behind his line to keep his men uh, rallied. And the famous quote, uh, some days, a corps, a corps commander's life doesn't matter. He's down near the southern end of his troops, where the where Standard's um, Vermont Brigade is, although they're not Second Corps troops. Um, and he's in his, on his horse. And he's rocked backwards, and he is injured um, when he's shot high in the right groin. So the groin to a medical professional, the groin is the crease between your leg and your pelvis. Okay. Okay. It's not the scrotum. It's not the penis. It's the the crease between your thigh and your pelvis. Um, That's where the hip joint is, and it's where a lot of important blood vessels are. The wound is described as being very high up, and he's bleeding pretty profusely. And in fact, one of the first things he says as he falls off his horse is, don't let me bleed to death. And he says that to uh, Benedict, who's one of the staff men for Stannard. Um, And Benedict, I've always found this to be a little ironic, looks at the wound and the blood that's coming out. There's a lot of blood coming out. But it's not pulsatile. It's not bright red. And so Benedict knows enough that it's venous blood. And he says to Hancock, don't worry, you won't die from this. This is not arterial bleeding. Well, really, uh, <laughs> the, staff, the staff guy says that. So Hancock naturally assumes he's talking to a doctor and says, well, thank you very much, doctor. <laughs> um, but... Um, <laughs> And then supposedly they put a tourniquet on, but I'm 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 not sure that I understand how a tourniquet uh, that high up on the thigh really does anything. I'm I'm glad to hear you say that yeah. because I never understood that, but I didn't want to be thought of as stupid, so I never asked because it doesn't make any sense if it's up high and the tourniquet. I mean, you can't put the tourniquet around your midsection. No. no. So you know what's that going to do if it's I, around your thigh? You know, the description is that they did it and they 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 uh, put a pistol in the in the handkerchief and twisted it and it staunched the bleeding. Um, I don't really know what to make of that. Again, from the description of the wound, I just I'm at a loss to really say that um, that it could have done very much. Now, and when you say that the wound was pretty high up, yeah. what do you mean by that? High up in the crotch. High up in the crotch. So, right. like, are we talking above the pubic bone? No, because that would not be in the groin. No, above but I'm the... saying uh, on line. So, if you make uh, a line uh, across uh, the body, yeah, top of the pubic yeah, bone. Yeah, if you went to the top of the pubic bone and went out to the thigh and just put your hand in the crease in your groin, it's going to be within two inches of that in the thigh, in the upper inner thigh. Upper inner thigh. Got it. Okay. And there's a lot of important structures there. Your hip joint is right there. Right. The femoral artery is right there. Um, uh, We know from what transpires and maybe what we'll talk about with this wound that it barely missed hitting the femoral artery, and that would have killed him. It was it was within an inch of hitting the femoral artery. You hit the femoral artery how long before you're out? Um, I mean, gone. Less than five minutes. Yeah. Yeah, you're going to bleed to death like that. Um, and many people know the story that somebody, either Hancock or maybe one of the responding doctors, reached into the hole and pulled a nail out, and Hancock was derisive towards the Confederates. Well, if they're, that's what they're firing. They must be out of ammunition. And now, in retrospect, we know that nail come from came from the pommel of his saddle because the bullet went through the pommel of the saddle before it went into him. So the, I'm fascinated with the story of his wound because, uh, now, I don't know the play-by-play of everything, but from what I understand, um, they couldn't figure out something about the wound. I can't remember. Like, they couldn't find the bullet. Is that what it was? Because yeah. when he was laying flat... It wasn't making any sense. And then someone got the bright idea, well, hey, he was hit on his horse. Let's put him on his horse. That's exactly right. Right? And yeah. then they found that there was a hole in the pommel. Right. And then, ah, oh, okay. The, there was a um, an inappropriate emphasis on getting the bullet out. People thought that was really important. And we don't worry much about that nowadays. We take bullets out if we encounter them. Um, there are many people who have uh, have 
been involved in pharmaceutical actions gone bad in the middle of the night that still walk around with a lot of bullets in their body. Um, <laughs> if, if, so in other words, it's not the bullet that no. kills you, it's what the bullet does that kills you. Yes, yeah, the damage associated with right. it. And the bullet is a piece of foreign material which will increase the likelihood of infection. So if you could get it out, it was felt to be important. But again, in, in modern uh, treatment of gunshot wounds, if a bullet is lodged in the middle of the thigh and it hasn't done any damage, we don't go in and take it out. Um, hmm. Some people even argue that you should go in to take it out for criminal evidence, but hmm. we don't do that. If it's not in the best interest of the patient, we just leave it there. Um, I had one patient in my career that got shot in the hip, and we went in and, and took it out because it was in his hip joint, and, ah, and that could yeah, be a problem. That would be painful. Um, God. So... July 3rd, 1863, Hancock gets injured. He makes his way back to his hometown, Norristown, Pennsylvania, right outside of Philadelphia. Sure. He's visited by a friend from Norristown, Dr. Lewis Wernwag Reed, who is in charge of uh, a big general hospital in Baltimore, McKim United States Hospital, which, interestingly, a number of casualties from Gettysburg end up at McKim Hospital. Um, but he just comes to see his friend Hancock, and, and he describes how bad Hancock looks. And Hancock has lost a ton of weight. His color's bad. And Hancock says, I think I'm going to die. Hmm. And, and as, as Dr. Reed is leaving, he realizes what you said. He said, wait a minute. You were on a horse. Everybody who's probed this wound, you've been lying down with your leg up. Let's stand you up like your leg would have been... Uh, or at least get you on a chair with your leg extended like it would have been on a horse. And then when he probed it, he found the bullet and was able to take it out. Now, that set Hancock on a, a much improved um, course of getting better. But by this time, and that was August 21st, so we're oh, six weeks after the injury. So then I guess would could we assume that some healing would have taken so, place? Some healing would have taken place, but... He has now developed what's called osteomyelitis, or a bone infection, in his pelvis, because that's where the bullet hit. The bullet hit on what's called, bear with me, everybody, the ischial tuberosity. That's your sitter. <laughs> if you put your hand on your butt and you feel a bone, that's what you sit on? The butt bone. Yeah, the butt bone. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's got another it name so, than the butt bone. Yeah. It's it called was the, the ischial the tuberosity. Yeah, 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 that's right. <laughs> and uh, Thank you. <laughs> So wait, so okay, so sit, let me let me pretend I'm on a horse. Okay, so he gets shot, so and goes through the palm. So it like skimmed under his, under him, sort of, right? The bullet went in the upper right groin, went behind the hip joint, oh. and into the butt bone. So like deflected down into the butt bone, well, maybe, or up into it, or up into yeah. it. Yeah. Mm. Um, so uh, that area stayed open in what's called a sinus. Kind of like a fistula, only there's only one end to it, okay. along the lines of what we talked about. Uh -huh. And it was discharging pus and bone fragments and, and, <sighs> and material. It, it <laughs> improved. <laughs> hey, am I, I did a living at this. Um, <laughs> I don't know. It improved, uh, it improved significantly after the bullet, the foreign piece of material was removed. But once a bone infection is established... Especially in a day and age when there were no antibiotics, which of course there weren't, you're never going to cure this infection. And, so it's just going to be constant. Yep. Yeah. And and I think people who know of Hancock and his history know that he 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 dealt with this wound uh, for a long time, and ultimately by de December of 1864 he has to leave field command because he's not fit enough because of his wound to be out commanding troops. Here's an ignorant question, or maybe stupid. I'm not sure. Maybe I do know better. Um, Let's say you have that open wound like mm -hmm. that, right? Mm -hmm. With the sinus. Mm -hmm. um, wh wh you can't like irrigate it with alcohol and that would kill. How did. Wh 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 like the infection is the body's way of fighting off a foreign object. Is that correct? It's, it's the body's defenses to try to, try to heal it. To try to but heal it. But if you don't have any way to kill the bacteria that are there, and the alcohol won't kill bacteria. Okay. That's bromine, the answer to my question. Bromide solutions were better, but still wouldn't kill all bacteria. The problem with bacteria in the bone is the bone can harbor these bugs and these little interstices really forever. And oftentimes, the only way to cure a bone infection is to remove that piece of the bone. 
And that's true even today. When people who have motorcycle accidents end up with an amputation, Mm -hmm. it's usually because of a delayed infection that can't be cured with antibiotics after multiple, multiple surgeries. Huh. Okay. So it's still an issue. All right. So, okay. So back to Hancock. So he's Mm -hmm. got... um, He's got a sinus leaking out of his ass. Oh uh, yes, and um, this is going. And now, but the, as it's leaking, bone fragments are still coming up. For how long? How many years are we talking after? Probably the, the rest of his the life. rest of his life. Yes, yeah, yeah. because there are dead pieces of bone that are called a sequestrum, and they have no blood circulation. They're just islands of dead bone. Okay, they eventually piece off and start to float out on the fluid that's coming out of there. Ugh. Yeah, that's pretty, so, pretty icky. So nasty. Yeah. <laughs> so um okay the, what does how does this cuz we were talking about him before the show he had the beatus he gained a lot of weight yes, yes. hancock yeah. later in life yeah. right because of this wound you can't, you can't do anything I, I mean is that what it was or is I, it just I don't know age? that we can say he he became obese and became diabetic because of the wound, I think he became obese because a lot of us pound on the uh, the uh, weight as we get older. And if you've got the right genetics, that sets you up for having diabetes. Sure. But it isn't going to help his ability to heal a wound as a diabetic. Right. That makes it even harder. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So then does he have a lot of problems? Because, you know, back going back to Hancock, or no, sorry, Chamberlain, um, there's a photograph of him as an old man mm-hmm. on a horse mm-hmm. in some parade. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when I first saw it, I was like, oh, what a stately looking figure he makes on a horse, you mm-hmm. know. But now that I know what he's dealing with, that he's sitting, but he's probably sitting up so straight and tall because he's like standing on the stirrups because it hurts to actually sit on well, the horse. Or the, I don't know what he's doing. The difference in those wounds between Chamberlain and Hancock. Mm-hmm. Hancock's wound is where your pressure is when you're sitting. Right. Hancock's wound is up front of that. That's up. Chamberlain. I'm sorry. Chamberlain's yeah. wound is in the front of that. So you could sit on your butt comfortably with Chamberlain's wound. Yeah, but okay. Okay. If you have any kind of, uh, and I'm going to try to be as delicate as I can here. Um, well, forget it, folks. We're talking about medicine and grow up if you can't handle this. If you have any kind of discomfort or pain or something wrong with your uh, your boys. Your, your penis. The okay, your penis, penis or scrotum, your testicles, your, testicles. your scrot, whatever. Um, I don't care where your pressure point is. Yeah. If you're sitting on a horse, I've ridden a horse and... Uh, you know, I, I, I've i had, you know, there's some days where you just wake up and your balls are sore. You've, you've, we've all had these problems, right? And uh, and so you you go out and you ride it. Your underwear's too tight. Your jeans are too tight. Whatever. Everything's bunched up and, and it hurts. So I'm, I, I got to imagine that even for Chamberlain with his wounds being where they are, being on a horse was still a pretty painful thing. Yeah. So you're talking to a guy who never has been on a horse in his life. Yes. Well, you should try Because I took it. care of, no, I took care of people who were on horses and had bad outcomes. Oh, don't tell me. Um, that's, that's my favorite thing in the know, world. I, I want to uh, get back into it. So uh, <laughs> I wouldn't know about uh, pain in my privates from riding on a horse. So if you tell me it happens, Matt, I'll- Well, I'm not saying it's from riding on a horse. Okay. It I'll, could be from anything. Okay. You know, <laughs> like you got that. What do they call that? With the, the torsion? Is that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 like you have that or something, yeah, yeah, or no. yeah, who knows? Yeah. Or sometimes if you're just wearing a pair of underwear that's too, t- the best thing to do when you ride a horse is not wear loose pants because you'll get saddle sores. So you wear tight jeans, and if you wear tight underwear too, everything gets kind of well, bunched I, up. I appreciate that advice, but I really won't need to know that. Thank you very much. <laughs> if you ever do, okay, just come to me. All right, I will. So, so that just explains why you know Kelly and Generals in bronze. You know, Stiple's book. Yes. Uh, and Kelly's recollections of talking to these different generals. Yes. Why Hancock is never sitting. He's always standing Probably. or he's pacing. Yeah. It's because he can't sit down. He can't keep, tolerate pressure keep, on uh, his ischial tuberosity. Yeah, wow. that's what I was going to say. Wow, okay. Yeah, that, uh, that's got to be tough, man. <laughs> But it was probably uncomfortable to sit back in those days anyways, because even the cushion chairs weren't that comfortable. Right, and and who knows? I mean, obviously, uh, Winfield Scott Hancock had a very full post-Civil War life, uh, you know, running for president. uh, Right. It's not like he sat around and did nothing. And and I think most people, uh, there's a very good article in Gettysburg Magazine entitled, in fact, um, Don't Let Me Bleed to Death. Um, 
The author is Stephen Wright, not the comedian. I was sure. going to say. Um, it's from I 1992, love his so it's, uh, it's, it's older. But it goes into great detail about the wounding and how when Hancock came back to view his wounding marker, and this had to have just sent John Batchelder into a tiz, uh, <laughs> Hancock says, well... That's not where it happened, but uh, <laughs> and he describes how he was laying and what he could see. And there's a famous picture in the article, including Batchelder with the group. And I can just about picture Batchelder's uh, ears going uh, round in circle, like, <laughs> "Oh man!" <laughs> so he, um, all right. So when does he die? Um, 1887, 1888, and. But it's not related to this wound, you said. No, he developed a, uh, I'll use the late term, a boil, a carbuncle. That's the medical term. Fatty carbuncle? Yeah. yeah. (laughs) And because he's a diabetic, he's more prone to infections, and that infection causes blood poisoning, sepsis, and that's what he dies from. Okay. Yeah. Um, and that's what that's what blood poisoning is, is sepsis. Yes. Yeah. So when people talk about, you know, oh, blood poisoning. Right. Yeah. I don't know if I've asked you this before. I don't know if I asked anybody, but if I did ask it, I'm sorry to the listeners for repeating myself. But um, Lonesome Dove. Do you ever see Lonesome Dove? No. You don't have to have seen it to know. Main character. Uh, well, you know, it's a ugh, it's a 30 year old movie. So if you haven't seen it by now, I don't care that I'm ruining it for you. Uh, Spoiler. Well, yeah, Robert Duvall's character, Gus. <laughs> okay. Um, fun-loving guy. Everybody loves Gus. Um, he and uh, another guy on the cattle drive. They're on a cattle drive, you know. They're they're up in Montana, and uh, there's a herd of buffalo. And they're standing there admiring them. They're scouting up ahead of the herd, and uh, they admire the buffalo. And Gus says, let's chase him. You want to? And the other guy goes, well, I don't know. Those <laughs> buffalo, those horns will hook you. And he goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, you know, and so they get into this whole discussion. Why should we chase the buffalo? They're not doing anything to us. And he's just like, you know, just because we're alive on the earth and let's just be free and enjoy life. You know, let's chase the goddamn buffalo. So he goes and chases the buffalo and the other guy just kind of sits there and they go over a hill and out of his sight. And then he hears a rumbling and soon Gus comes back being chased by By Indians. No, by by Indians. Indians. Okay. And he's got an arrow in his leg. Okay. Okay. And they get um, holed up in a gully somewhere and, uh, you know, in the dirt. And eventually Gus is starting to get fever. He's got the infection and everything like that. They got to take the... Gets to a town and is... um, He wakes up laying in bed with one of his legs missing. Okay. Doctor says... That other leg is going to have to come off, but I had such trouble with the first one that I needed to take a break. Uh, Otherwise, the blood poisoning is going to spread and you'll die. And I always wondered, nothing happened to that other leg. Why would he have to take that off? Yeah, I'm is not, that is that Hollywood or the author yeah. of the novel getting that wrong? Or I, I wouldn't say that's medically accurate. I think that if you get sepsis or you get blood poisoning it's because you had an infection in one part of your body and the bacteria that are causing the infection spills into your bloodstream and now circulates through your body. Yeah, you can get an infection from that in your kidneys, right. in the lining of your heart, in your lungs, and you could get it in your leg. But removing the leg or the lungs prevent. or anything is not going to help no, prevent not, it. Right. No, you would only remove the leg if it was clear that there was a reason to remove the leg then and now while you're looking at it. So then one of the most horrible death scenes to ever watch in a movie, um, heartbreaking, uh, was based on medical bullshit, basically, is what you're if, saying. If that's what you're talking to me about, yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Sorry to do that to you. But no, yeah. no, no. That's fine. Yeah. Still a beautiful scene between two best friends. There you go. <laughs> uh, all right. So uh, let's see. Go. Let's go to... Uh, well, Mikey, actually, go ahead. <clears throat> do you mind if I... Go to one other officer here. Let's go from the MVP of the battle to the man who thought he was the MVP of the battle. How about Daniel Sickles? Yeah, uh, I was Dan trying Sickles. to avoid that bastard, oh, but okay, no, that, let's go on. No, Dan one, Sickles. I'd be disappointed if we yeah, didn't, no, of course. didn't stop with General General Dan, as many people call him. Yeah, Sickles. Um, um, you know, let's let's say a few good things about Sickles. 
If you can. <laughs> uh, well, uh, he, his soldiers liked fighting for him. He was awarded the Medal of Honor, I think, mainly to shut him up. Uh, sorry, Jim. Uh, uh, but, um, yeah, uh, I when I came into the recording studio, Mike was right behind me, and he had uh, Jim Hessler's— um, uh, Peach and, Orchard and, book. And Br- Eisenberg's Peach Orchard book. And uh, Jim's book on, on sickles— uh, which predated the book that you have, is just an excellent, excellent source for information on sickle's wound. And it's it's part of, because of what I do, I don't go deeply medical on most tours unless people want me to, but I, I usually say something about sickle's. That story is so compelling. So he's down near the Trossel Barn, just, um, what, maybe a half a mile off of the Emmitsburg Road at about 6 o'clock on July 2nd, watching his troops try to hold back this massive Confederate assault uh, of up to 15,000 troops. And they're doing the best they can, but they're getting overwhelmed. A, A solid shot comes bouncing across the ridges and strikes his right leg, doesn't injure the horse because the horse is looking west and hits Sickle's right leg. And Sickles writes himself, and I'm going to read this quote. um, I never knew I was hit. So Sickles is saying, I didn't know I was hit. Hmm. I was riding the lines and was tremendously interested in the terrific fighting which was going on along my front. Suddenly I was conscious of dampness along the lower part of my right leg, and I ran my hand down the leg of my high-top boots, and pulling it out, I was surprised to see it dripping with blood. Hmm. And this is definitely an understatement. Soon I noticed the leg would not perform its usual functions. <laughs> so he goes to get off the horse. He has to lift his leg off the horse. Yeah. And he gets off the horse, and um, he's starting to pass out because he's losing a lot of blood. Um, and this continues in his quote. He says, they, talking about his staff and the medical staff, they found that the knee had been smashed probably by a piece of shell, and the leg had been broken above and also below the knee. But while all this damage had been done, I had not been unhorsed and never knew exactly when the hurt was received. So would that tell you if it was damaged above and below the knee that the knee was where the impact was? No, it, it had to be two. It, it had to be maybe two impacts, oh. or it could have been one really bad impact. And if he fell from his horse, which he's not really saying he did, he could have broken the lower part of the leg in the fall. Okay. Um, but I don't think we'll really know that. But what we do know is that the wound was more extensive than what we see when we look at this preserved specimen of Dan Sickle's leg, because we see a fracture in the middle of his lower leg where yeah. the bone is broken. But the specimen is from the knee down. There's no evidence of any injury above the knee. And and I think what happened, I think what happened when I go through this, and I've talked to Jim about, Jim Hessler about this, I think this was quite a mangling injury. And I think that it might have rivaled Bayard Wilkinson's injury on July 1st out on huh. Barlow's Knoll, where maybe it was only hanging by a shard of, uh, of tissue. And there has been... It's really not clear where he was taken to have the amputation done. Hmm. It may have been the John Patterson farm along the Tawny Town Road, or it may have been if it was just shards hanging on there. His staff could have put a tourniquet on, which they did, and just completed the uh, the amputation on a rock right by the Trussell barn. And he, but did we have, did we, has somebody said that's what they did, or are you just it, speculating? It's, it's never clear where the amputation yeah. was done. He's taken to the Schaefer barn over near the modern day outlets on the Baltimore Pike. Right. And he has an operation there. But if they did the amputation because his leg was just flopping, what they would have done there was what's called a debridement. They would have cleaned it out sure. and tried to prevent it from getting infected. So they would have and finished then it. it up. Yeah. 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 Okay. Exactly. So I don't know that he had the amputation done at that house or whether he had a debridement done there, but he had he had some form of a surgery done. Well, because now you're talking about the specimen and f- from what I recall, the the small bone, the fibula, the fibula. It looks like it's broken. Am I right, it or am broken, I mixing? But it's not mangled. It's, it's, no. it's kind of a. I didn't like this term in my profession. It's a clean break. It's a simple fracture. So, but the tibia, the shin bone, the main shin bone is shattered. Yes. Right. So the okay. So then, it 
does is that indicating that's where the impact was to it you, could be. or it, it could, could be. be? Yeah. But now you said it could be more than one. Right. Impact. Right. And that's a little hard to explain. Yeah, I was going to uh, say, explain that. Unless, um, <laughs> unless the really mangling injury that the cannonball caused was above the knee, and maybe there was another. Um, a bullet could have caused the lower injury. A piece of shrapnel could have caused the lower injury. It's kind of hard to tie that all together, except that it seems that the more severe part of the injury was actually above the knee, not that we can see on the specimen, because I think that's where they took his leg off. I think they took it off right through where the upper fracture was and cleaned it up. Because That makes sense. If you look at the specimen, it's from the knee joint down, and that's an operation called a knee disarticulation. You take the leg off through the knee joint. His amputation is higher than that. It's an above-the-knee amputation. And so the amputation is not what we see in the specimen. It's more extensive than that. That's probably way too much detail. But, no, but for I, a guy I love like that me, stuff. that's interesting. Yeah, no, I find it fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, because I feel someday I'm going to have to perform some kind of surgery on someone out in the woods somewhere. When is that right? All hell, yeah. Well, when all hell breaks loose, that's we're all going to be on our own. It, it'll be me. It'll be, I'll, yeah. I'll get on the car tour. <laughs> that might, before, that <laughs> might be before all hell breaks loose. Exactly. That might be in a couple of weeks. Yeah. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> I hope not, too. I'll try to be wrong. <laughs> yeah, please do. <laughs> um. All right. Uh, so, uh, sickle. You want to finish sickles there? Yeah, the you? only other thing I would say about sickles, and of course, you would have to believe this would happen. Eighty percent of all surgery gets infected in the Civil War. Yeah. Guess who doesn't get an infection? Sickles. Sam sickles. Yeah. Yeah. He, he never has any problems with healing. Um, I've never seen a picture of him in a prosthesis, an artificial limb. Mm. Um, uh, I did ask. I was speaking somewhere about this, and someone who has. Uh, written fairly extensively, uh, said that she had seen a picture of him wearing a prosthesis, but I never have, and um, I can't, I don't know that Jim has told me that he's seen a picture of it. So, interestingly, he endorsed certain prosthetics as ones that he would wear. Never wore them. But, yeah, I've never seen a picture of him wearing one. Sure. Um, how about uh, how about Stephen Weed? Weed, yeah, that's yeah. An interesting. Uh, oh wait, before uh, sorry, you said yeah. something in Sickles that I wanted to go to because he's not on the list. Before we go to Weed, uh, you mentioned Baird Wilkinson. Yes, um, talk about his wound because yeah. So first of all, Tim Smith loves to ruin I, myths, I and um, and so he said that um, he didn't amputate his own leg. Yeah, I, I, I heard Tim say that, and I don't necessarily disagree with that. I think it takes a tremendous amount of wherewithal and moxie to say, well, I think I'll just cut my own leg off because it's just hanging here. Where's my pocket knife? Right. But if it was a shattered and mangled extremity, as it well could have been, somebody probably just did the snip job, whether it happened uh, in the almshouse where he was taken to or whether it happened out on Blockers slash Barlow's Knoll. Um, but— uh, that was clearly an injury, as it's described, that was what we call a mangling injury. The bone was shattered. The muscles were cut. The arteries were, were, were um, cut. Um, that's not a hard thing to do, to do that amputation. It's almost all done. Right, exactly. Yeah, You're right. just finishing what uh, right. the the cannonball or whatever did. Right. But so so. But you don't know. We don't know too many details about his because he died. So right. there would have right. been no point to study it. I, I guess. I you know the legend is you're right, Matt, that he finished his own amputation. But I, I've. I've never read anything in great detail that he, in fact, did finish his own amputation. Okay. Uh, but, and and the, I think the sad story, though, that Tim told that I had never heard before is um, that while he was laying there, um, the guy next to him was dying of thirst, and he gave him his canteen. And he was a Confederate, I believe. Oh, really? Yeah, I believe. And um, the as the guy was drinking the water, uh, Wilkinson died. Yeah, yeah. So the last thing he did was help yeah. a fellow sufferer. Well, and I would challenge anybody who follows the Civil War, the Battle of Gettysburg, to read his father's account of... Uh, on July 5th or 6th as he's holding his dead son's body mm. and not be brought to tears. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's one of the most poignant writings in the entire American Civil War. Yeah. That had to be tough. Yeah. yeah. Uh, all right. Stephen Weed. Let's get to him Stephen now. Weed. So Stephen Weed. Little Round Top. Right. Um, um, so Strong Vincent's brigade goes up and is heavily involved in saving the, uh, the south face of Little Round Top. 
Um, Weed Brigade gets up there, led by the 140th New York and Patrick O'Rourke, who we talked about. And Weed is up on top of the crest of Little Round Top and gets shot in the neck um, by ostensibly a sharpshooter down in Devil's Den. Um, I have uh, fellow guide friends who have been out on the battlefield with modern day snipers who question whether that's a shot that could really I'm be, so glad be made. To hear, I'm glad to hear you say this because yeah. I never bought the sar- the sharpshooter I, thing. You know, I don't, I'm not a gun guy. I don't shoot guns. The only thing I know about guns is what I have to know to be a guide. And uh, um, one of my good friends said I had a modern day sniper out there and he said I don't think that shot can be made. No. So it was I'm, probably I'm, I'm, somebody on the face of the of Round Top closer to General Weed who, who shot him. My nickname used to be Dead Eye. Oh, really? um, yeah, well, it was because it was lazy. And, oh, okay. Yeah, but um, <laughs> well, I got that corrected. And then, uh, <laughs> no, but uh, so here, this is what I think it is. Um, there's a battle going on, and you're on top of a hill. Right. And when you're, when you're fighting, uh, at, from what I understand, I haven't done this, and I'm not an expert on firearms, but from what I've heard by many, from many other people, is that if you're firing where your target is on a hill, or you know it's going to throw off your aim. There's going to be overshoots. This is rough terrain. You're you're running up this rough terrain. Maybe you're taking a shot or something. I think it was a stray shot. Well, in, in the discussion that that my friend had with the modern day sniper was even the fact that there was uh, a much smaller body of water at the bottom of the hill than there is now. <laughs> but even that can affect uh, the accuracy of a shot. But how? Uh, I don't know other than... You should whether, have asked him. I, I wasn't talking directly with him. Oh, okay. Guns scare me. Um, <laughs> yeah, they should. Um, I'm, I'm too used to putting people back together after that. Yeah. The, um, but Weed gets shot in the neck, but he's not killed instantly. Unlike, um, unlike Patrick O'Rourke, who was also shot in the neck. In fact, it's pretty well documented. Weed is rendered quadriplegic, meaning he was shot through the neck and through the spine, and he could not use his arms from the shoulders down in the lower part yeah. of the body. So, in essence, that's the very same injury that John Wilkes Booth suffered mm. uh, when he was shot in the barn that was on fire around him right. when he was caught. So, Weed is taken off the battlefield and taken to the Jacob Weikert farm, one of the 500 Weikert farms on the battlefield. <laughs> but it's right behind Little Round Top on Tawny Town Road. And um, he's tended to that evening on July 2nd by Tilly Pierce, who we know um, so really everything. leaves one of the, uh, the best um, uh, accounts of what a young girl saw and heard at the Battle of Gettysburg. Um, Alternatively known as the girl who saw everything. Yeah, the girl yes. who saw everything. Um, <laughs> And if I understand things correctly, um, General Weed made Tilly um, promise that she would come back the next morning to take care of him again. And when she came back, he had uh, he died. He was dead. Yeah. And and the accounts that I have read say that on the front porch of the Jacob Weikert farm are laid three bodies of people who died up on Little Round Top, one right next to each other. Hmm. Patrick O'Rourke, Stephen Weed, and and uh, Hazlitt, hmm. the artillery commander. Now, so Hazlitt was another one. So, because Weed gets hit while talking to Hazlitt, who was already hit, right? I think it was the other oh, way the around. the other way around. Yeah, okay. Hazlitt leans over to hear Weed's, and I've heard this two different ways, to either hear Weed's last words or to try to square a gambling debt. I heard that <laughs> once also. Um, well, but, there's a third. And then he's shot in the head. There's a third story that I heard. Oh, yeah? Um, <clears throat> he was, you know, last words, and he leaned down, and the words were, duck. <laughs> I, I, I haven't seen that account. I have not seen that account. Should have listened. <laughs> he should have. Yeah. Oh. Um, uh, no, that's an old guy joke. You've never heard that I've before? never heard that. Oh, really? <laughs> that's why I love being a guy. I learn something every time I hang out with people. All right, let's get into some of the, uh, we'll do like, let's do three more. Okay. Um, uh, all right, Lonzo Cushing. I'm working my way down into lesser knowns. I want to get into some lesser knowns, people. But go ahead, Mike. Oh, uh, yeah. I've got one, too, that I want to go Okay. Into, okay. So, so Lonzo. Cushing? Lons. We'll Lons. start with Lons. Lon. He went by oh, Lon. Lon, excuse me. Yeah. Let me get my notes up on him. Alonzo Cushing, name well-known, artillery commander at the Angle, had six um, six guns in his battery, 
by the time everything is falling apart as Pickett's charge is um, coming up close to the angle, he's down to two guns. Um, he has already been wounded twice uh, as he rolls his um, two guns to a, within about 10 feet of the wall there at the angle. He's already been shot in the right shoulder. And as w- well documented in Kent Masterson Brown's biography of Alonzo Cushing, he's been wounded in the testicles, um, which um, um, is described, I think, very succinctly as a very severe and painful wound. Yeah. Uh, not, uh, we would all agree with that. I would I mean, too, he's, yeah. I mean, he's in, he's in really bad she- shape. He's losing a lot of, of blood. He's uh, vomiting. Um, his sergeant, who um, Frederick Fuger, who I believe is awarded the Medal of Honor, urges Cushing to go to the rear. And Cushing says, no, I stay right here and fight it out or I die in the attempt. Mm. And um, as many people know, he's thumbing the vent hole of one of his guns without a, without a thumb stall, just with his bare, um, mm. his, his bare thumb. I figure with all the pain he's going through anyway, that's it's, the it's least of his worries. He's been shot the testicles, yeah, yeah exactly. Um, when he takes a third shot, and the description of it is, is well outlined in uh, uh, Kent Masterson Brown's um, book, it enters right below his nose and lodges in the back of his head. Mm. And that's a fatal wound at the instant that it's there. And he falls into Fugger's arms and is laid on the ground where his, his monument is. So um, I think even if he hadn't taken the wound to his head— uh, a wound of the genital area and all the uh, blood loss and, mm. and likely infection with that would have probably been a mortal wound and he would have died of that. The shoulder wound would have been been livable with for sure. Well, let's go through that, the wounds because um, I was watching something and they were, they were making fun of old movies. Okay. And how, you know, it, 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 you know it was, I think they were talking about one of those John Wayne um Detective movies that he tried doing in the seventies that were just awful, like yeah. McHugh and you <laughs> yeah. know, and um, I think there was a shot where he, you know, he gets shot and he gets shot in the shoulder, and this happens in all these old movies and maybe movies today. You get shot in the shoulder, and you know, t- ten minutes later you're functioning fine. You haven't even gone to the doctor yet, but you know, it's just a flesh wound. It's like the meaty part of the shoulder, the meaty part Ooh. of the so- the shoulder, is what they often say. But um, there's a lot in your shoulder that could kill you if well, you get hit, correct? The meaty part of the shoulder would be beyond the bone in the arm and to the outside. There's not a lot of meat out there. Right. If you go in towards the chest, there's a thing there called the lungs. <laughs> That if you're shot there, <laughs> there's not much meaty about the lungs. It's mostly air it's and right, blood right, vessels. Right. So <laughs> if you're going to survive being shot in the shoulder, you can get shot through the bone in the shoulder and survive that. Sure. Um, you know, again, if it doesn't hit a major blood vessel, um, right? But you, you can that's what I'm saying. That. You have an artery going down to your through yeah, your arm, your armpit. Yeah, right, yeah. The and, armpit, the bloody armpit. Right. And and if you go towards the chest, um, being shot in the chest. Uh, statistics on that that are two thirds of people shot in the chest will will die of their injury. Mm. One third can survive, so it's better than the abdomen, but it's still a pretty significant injury. I mean, that's uh, like the the chest, though. I mean, you got the lungs and the heart there. Yeah, the lungs, the heart, the esophagus, the trachea. You're swallowing and breathing too. Right. But you can survive a bullet wound to the chest if it goes in, if it hits a rib, that isn't going to kill you. If it goes through the lung and causes bleeding as it goes through the lung, but it doesn't hit a major artery or blood vessel, and it goes out the back of your chest, um, you may be able to survive that. You get a collapsed lung, but um, you can survive that. So it is a survivable wound, but still there's a lot of important stuff in that part of the body. So, okay, so he's got that shoulder wound, but whatever it is, it's, it's not stopping him from doing his duties. Correct. Next shot is the groin. Yeah, into the test. Into the te- and so it actually, because this is another thing, people use the word groin, and as you pointed out, talking about Hancock there, the medical definition of groin is a very specific thing. Absolutely. We, normal people, not normal, lay people think uh, of the gro- we, we're talking about our crotch. No. But no, that's not no, what it is. No. And, and where's the loin? 
the loins that cut them. Where do babies I come eat? from? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know where the loin is, and I do know where babies come from. My son is an ob- obstetric <laughs> resident is here with us. Oh, today. are you? Yeah. Oh, very nice. He delivers babies. Um, very nice. The um, the injury to the testicles is uh, is a very devastating injury. Without even just you know focusing on the emotional part of that. Uh, yeah. A lot of blood vessels, a lot of blood loss. The pain. And, and the, uh, on, on tours, I usually describe this injury, depending on the group I have, right. as being shot in the lower abdomen and holding his guts in. Oh. That's not accurate, but I decide usually not to focus on the fact that this man was shot in the testicles. Right. Uh, He's holding his nuts in. He is holding yes. his nuts in. And that's, so, that's not what mom, dad, and the tenant. 12 year old want to hear. I'm glad you said that though, because I have heard other guys say lower abdomen. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, wait, I thought he got shot in the yeah. bowls. He and did. so, yeah, so, but they're being polite. Yeah. And, like, and right. I would say, again, probably 95% of the time, that's how I describe the injury just uh, the lower abdomen, holding his guts in. Yeah. But, but in reality, not we're not we're not being polite here. So, no, in reality, he's shot in the testicles and he's holding his nuts in. <laughs> okay. And the, that has got to be the most painful. Well, yeah, for I mean, those you know, of us of a male gender, I mean, guys yeah, know what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. You know, well, you without just, even getting shot there, it can be a problem. You're in the locker room after yeah. the football game. Your buddy wants to be an ass. He comes by, flicks it with his finger, and you're bent over. Not that that's happened to me because yeah. I, I wasn't in any sports, but my brother-in-law was, and he told me that's what they used to do. They go around and fly. well, and I think <laughs> most of us know people who've. <laughs> been injured in the in the uh, testicle area that I mean it can evoke vomiting. I mean you can yeah. puke from. Oh, it. I know. Oh, yeah. it, it doesn't take much for it to hurt, yeah. and, and and at least make you stop and kind of just, just oh kind of like God. brace yourself yeah. and like double over a little yeah. bit, <laughs> catch your breath. It's hard to breathe, and then but I can't imagine. I've never been squarely kicked in the balls, but no. that's got to make you puke. Yeah. And that, and as I said, I've never been on a horse. So and getting I'm, shot. I'm, yeah. Well, on a horse, it doesn't hurt getting on a horse. No, but getting kicked in the nuts would hurt if you were on a horse. <laughs> well, well, yeah. But I, I stay away from horses. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely stay away from their asses if right, you ever yeah. go near one. Right, right. Um, but they could also kick you from the side, too, so you got to be careful there. But anyway, so, okay, so now he's holding them in, and this is something I've always wondered. So, like I said, you get kicked in the balls or you hurt them in some way. And it's hard to breathe. Oh, yeah. You don't have that le- lower ab strength. You probably do, but you don't think you do because of the pain, right? And right. so you're, you're weakened for a moment. As I understand it, he's laying there holding himself together, barking out orders. Right. Now, is he, is he yelling the orders or is he whispering to the sergeant? It's my understanding that he's, uh, he's um, giving the orders, or at least in conversational tone, to Sergeant Fugger that okay. I'll, I'll, I'll die fighting here. Uh, I don't know that he's, maybe he's only whispering, I don't know, but, uh, but I, it's my impression he's in a, at least a conversational tone. Earlier, he had seen one of his uh, uh, battery crews start to leave their position, and he was very vocal and said, um, Sergeant Weston, come back to your post. The first man who leaves his post again, I'll blow your brains out. So he was <laughs> very clearly yeah. getting the message across prior to his injuries. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's see then. So that's uh, that's Lons there. Oh, and then the final one you said was like the upper Yeah, right lip. below the nose and lodged in the back of the brain. Yeah, and that put him out of his misery. Yes, it did. 21 years old? 22 years 22 old. 22 years old. Graduated from West Point, 1861, 1862. Yeah. Very good friends with uh, James Deering, who's the artillery the commander on the other side yeah. of the field. Yeah. The Pickett's Division? Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Um, barely, barely a man, and yet did so much. Mike, go ahead. All right. <clears throat> so the one I'm curious about is John Gibbon. Yeah. Oh, what happens to the next Gibbon. one I was going to do. <laughs> I'm going in the area where they were. Go ahead. Yeah. So John Gibbon, um, I think it's very interesting, and I usually try to bring this up on tours. Uh, Gibbon is born in Philadelphia, but where does he grow up? He grows up in North Carolina. And so he is... Uh, stays loyal to um, his oath at West Point. 
But across the field in the 28th North Carolina, his brother's a surgeon and his other brother's an officer over there. So he's got two brothers and two brother-in-laws on the other side of the line at, at Gettysburg. Um, Gibbon um, is a division commander under Hancock in the Second Corps. And uh, he'd been wounded once before. Um, in the wrist, I don't know that that left him with any real residual problems. Um, but he's moving on July 3rd from north to south down what is now modern-day Hancock Avenue. It was just the ridge then. And um, uh, he's actually with his aide, uh, Lieutenant Frank Haskell, who writes one of the best-known accounts of what happens in Pickett's Charge. Um, he's standing in a clump of bushes. And as he gets back up onto the ridge, he's shot in the left shoulder. So here we are with a shoulder injury again. The meaty part. Um, well, it was the meaty part for him. Okay. The description is the bullet entered mid-left arm, so that would be halfway between your elbow and your shoulder, and then passed behind the shoulder blade. So it stayed, it stayed on the outside half, not the inner half. So it didn't go into his chest. Okay. It, it came out by his shoulder blade. So that's an injury that is eminently survivable. But um, it took him out of commission, obviously, for the rest of that day. And uh, he didn't come back to uh, field command um, for quite some period of time. And we talked briefly about how he and Hancock had a falling out after the Battle of Reams Station in August of 1864. So um, his wound was significant, but I don't, pending infection or something like that, I don't think people would have expected he would have died from it. Mm. Hmm. Anything to add that? Oh, no. That's, All right. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We'll move on then. Uh, let's, get, let's go to a name that I'm not familiar with. Uh, who's Max Thoman? Thoman. Thoman. Max Thoman. Yeah, that's um, – uh, my buddy Fran Fiak and I have done a, a battle walk where we walked Cemetery Ridge and just talked about a lot of people, some who we've talked about here and other people who uh, people aren't that familiar with. And one of those was – Max Thoman. Uh, he was a commander. I'm sorry. Um, Rick is going through his menu. I am going spiral. through my notes here. <laughs> and very spiral. organized. Three ring here binders. Is, I there we are. Yeah. Um, he's the commander of the 59th New York. Okay. They're, they're, they have a monument right there on the Right next the to the wall. 69th PA. Yeah. Just down we adopted the 59th to, New York. I should have known that. Michigan unit. Um, uh, which is interesting because the 59th New York also has four companies from North Central Ohio. Um, uh, he's a lieutenant colonel. He's uh, uh, given command of the unit in May of 1863. Um, just to show that you don't have to go to West Point, he was a liquor salesman in New York City before the war. All right. Um, <laughs> um, and he had the nickname the Jack of Diamonds. If somebody puts the squeeze to me and say, um, why is he called that? I'm not sure that I really know. But it was a pared down unit. There were only four companies uh, at the wall um, at Gettysburg. And on July 2nd, um, the 59th New York is firing into Wright's Georgians as they're coming over the wall in, in, in the attack on July 2nd. Um, it's, a, it's a very vicious fight. A uh, Toman is hit in the shoulder by a shell fragment. So that's different than a bullet. You've got a, a bigger piece of metal going down through the, um, the, um, the shoulder. I'm going to guess that that went the direction it shouldn't have because he dies on July 11th. So nine days after he sustained the injury. And that would tell me that he probably died of an infection. Okay. And he di died out at the Jacob <coughs> Schwartz farm which is out where the outlet malls are, where the old theater was, where the distillery is. Mm -hmm. That was the second corps um, hospital out there. Um, he wanted to be buried as close to the field where he was injured as he could be. And if I'm not mistaken, I believe he's the highest ranking officer killed at Gettysburg buried at the Soldiers National Cemetery. General Collis is buried up there, but he didn't fight at Gettysburg. Mm -hmm. But Max Toman was a lieutenant colonel and is buried with his men up on in the uh, New York section of the uh, of the Soldiers National Cemetery. 
So the shell fragments, I mean, obviously, I don't think this needs to be stated, but I'm going to uh, do substantial damage because yeah. they're all different sizes, but they're they're also jagged. They're just right. whatever if, shape they came out of. If it's if it's um, if it's a true shell projectile, the the pieces are large and sharp. If it's case shot, it may be a molded milk ball size of metal, but there's also the fragmentation from the shell itself. Yeah. So, um, and those are fired out of cannons, and so their kinetic energy is every bit as much or more than a bullet that's yeah. going through the air. Yeah. So it'll it'll cause a lot more damage. Uh, you know the story of Jeremiah Gage. I know that he's a Confederate, yes, but yes, uh, yeah. 11th Mississippi. Yes. Um, he's hit by a shell fragment prior to Pickett's charge during the uh, cannonade. Yeah, the bombardment. Um, when he goes the, to the dock, um, you know, he's also hit in the elbow. Yeah. I guess maybe it was the same fragment that went through both or whatever. But he goes to the doctor and he's like, I'm dying, doc. And the doctor's like, nah, you're fine. Yeah. Just take your arm off. And right. he's, no, that's no, not that's where the hurt is. About. Yeah. Yeah, and he, and he lifts the blanket. Yeah. And there the doctor describes a... Hole that goes clean through, I think, um, that has a black ooze around it, but no blood. Uh, that could be a number of things. That could be stool. Uh, or Gross. Um, because if he's shot through the bowels, that's what's going to come out is what's in the bowels. Shot through and, the bowels. And if it's the lower <laughs> bowels, it's poop. Yeah. That's basically what it is. And so could it, could it also, because I've heard, now this was not from a medical person, but could it also be that the fragment was so hot that it cauterized the wound as it went through and the, the black ooze is just the powder and soot from the shell? I think it would have to be pretty close to do that. It's like uh, looking at a gunshot wound. If there's powder burns, you know that it was very close right. to where it hit. Yeah. I would, if there's a black discoloration around a, a, a artillery fragment, I'd probably think it came more from the inside of the bowels than from any cauterization or heat from the uh, from the fragment itself. That's gross. Wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Didn't think of that. Yep. Poop. Uh, <laughs> all right. And uh, here's an interesting name. And I think I, th- I want to say he's near Toman. Um, Paul Joseph Revere. Revere? Yeah. 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 Colonel Paul Joseph Revere. He's the commander of the 20th Mass. You know, and if you read about the Massachusetts units on Cemetery Ridge, there's a great book. Um, um, it's so great, I'm blanking on the author. Um, <laughs> What's the name of the book? It's called, um, this is, uh, the quote is from Sumner Payne. Isn't this glorious? It's about the 15th um, and the 20th Mass and the 19th Mass. Um, but uh, Revere is the commander of the 20th Mass. Uh, the Harvard Regiment with the Pudding Stone mm-hmm. Monument. It's one of my it's favorite monuments. So distinctive. Uh, it's, it's interesting because when you look at the unit, at least what some of the accounts I've read, there were 31 students from Harvard. It's not like all, however many hundreds of them were Harvard students. Well, it's like the school teachers regiment. You know, yeah, it's like only a, 20 yeah, I know. school teachers, right. but yeah. Right. <laughs> and Colonel Paul Joseph Revere is the grandson of Paul Revere, which is interesting because the other guy who worked with Revere on that night in Boston was a guy named Dawes, who's, uh, I think, Rufus great grandson Dawes, yeah. is, is active on July 1st. Yeah. Um, well, Revere um, uh, got injured uh, at Ball's Bluff early in the war and, and ended up with an amputation. So he has a, um, an amputation of his right leg, I believe, as he's the commanding officer here at Gettysburg. If you remember, the 20th Mass gets pushed forward um, on July 2nd as, uh, as, as Meade is trying to plug holes out there that have been created by Sickles' movement. Um, and um, uh, Revere is shot in his remaining healthy leg and is having a really hard time getting off the field. Um, he's not captured. He is ultimately taken off. Um, uh, and he also then sustains an injury to his lung and abdomen from artillery. So he's shot in a, a bunch of different places. Um, he dies on July 4th. Um, 
in, uh, I'm sorry, there are two different accounts. One account says he died July 4th um, because he said he could hear the cheering on July 3rd. But there's another account that he got, uh, he was taken as far as Westminster and died on July 5th. So I'm not sure which of those dates of death are are accurate. Okay, so another officer... George Ward in the fifteenth yes. Massachusetts, fifteenth Mass, right? Uh, in the same, you know, in the same area, right? What what happens with him? Because he also had a injury suffered at Ball's Bluff as well that had an amputation, didn't he? Yes, that's that's exactly right. Uh, yeah, he's the uh, colonel of the fifteenth Mass, um, and he's dismounted. Yeah, and he gets hit in the other leg as well. But then he's carried to uh, maybe the Sarah Patterson. Farm on Tawny Town Road, um, and he dies at 4:30 in the morning. His injury occurs on July 2nd, and he dies uh, the morning of July 3rd um, from the leg wound, which means he must have had a significant vascular blood vessel injury as well. Because so. that's that monument out there at the uh, Kadori right yeah. yard yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. see him out there way out forward. Yeah. yeah, right. All right. So I think we have enough uh, names there. There's some more names on the list here, and uh, I would recommend you uh, try to get a tour with Rick and have him uh, tell you about these people. This would be. Do you do a tour based on this? I, I guess. Can, I, sure. Yeah, you yeah, should. We've yeah. Done, wow. We've done. Uh, it's been a, a, a battle walk that uh, my buddy Fran and I have done a couple times. I'm sure if somebody said, "I just want to hear about some of the officers and their wounds," uh, we could sure do a walking tour of that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So uh, do that. You, you've also got Confederate names uh, yeah. or Confederates that you could talk about, which we're going to do another show about soon. Um, and so, if you're interested in Confederates, uh, stick around for that show eventually. And also, Rick can do a tour for you there. But in the meantime, we're going to take a break, and then we're going to come back. We've got a good number of questions from our curious uh, patrons over at patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg. That's how you get to ask the questions on the show. So be sure that you go over and become a patron. I think we're at like 380 patrons as of today. So that's pretty good. Yeah. So we will uh, take a break and uh, talk to you on the other side of it. We'll be right back. Hey, summer is here, and Gettysburg's licensed battlefield guides are ready to kick off another full season of specialized battlefield walks on their favorite subjects. First, enjoy an educational stroll at sunset with Tuesday evening walks through history, starting on June 6th and going until the end of August. Then tours switch to Sunday afternoons and go to the end of October. The walks cost $35 each, and registration is required in advance. And don't forget, from September 22nd until the 24th, the Association of Licensed Battlefield Guides is proud to present Oak Ridge Attack and Defense. Three days, 10 licensed battlefield guides, seven battlefield tours, and much more. For the full schedule and registration, and don't forget you have to register for these, visit GettysburgTourGuides.org. GettysburgTourGuides.org. For the Historian has a wide variety of titles, new and used, of military books from publishers like Osprey, Gettysburg Publishing, Stackpole, Savis Beatty, UNC Press, and more. I make it a point to go there once a week because I have new bookshelves to fill and I never know what treasures I'll find, and neither will you. They even have toy soldiers, model kits, games, children's books, and more. So stop by and check them out on your next visit to Gettysburg, or better yet, order right now online at ForTheHistorian.com and mention that you heard about them on Addressing Gettysburg in the Note to Seller box, and they will refund you your shipping. And if you call 717-685-5207 or stop by the store on your next visit and mention us, you'll get 20% off retail price. That's ForTheHistorian.com or 717-685-5207. Seminary Ridge Museum and Education Center, Gettysburg's premier museum, is housed in the historic Lutheran Seminary Building constructed in 1832, a witness to the first day of battle. The museum's three floors of exhibits connect visitors to the dilemmas that led to the Civil War, provide a powerful and personal view of the battle's first day, and explore one of the battlefield's largest hospitals. No visit to Seminary Ridge Museum and Education Center is complete without a guided tour of the building's famous cupola, where on the eve of battle, officers and civilians saw thousands of Confederate soldiers' campfires 
burning to the west, and Brigadier General John Buford watched for vital federal reinforcements as fighting erupted on the morning of July 1st. Today, you can stand where Buford stood and discover how this view helped chart the course of the Battle of Gettysburg. Your trip to Gettysburg is not complete without a serious visit to Seminary Ridge Museum and Education Center, Gettysburg's premier museum. Purchase tickets online at seminaryridgemuseum.org or call 717-339-1300. To get tickets or a cupola tour, listeners may call or walk in and mention address in Gettysburg or by ordering online using the promo code AG1863 for 20% off. Seminary Ridge Museum and Education Center. It began here. There's a devil to pay. If you're a lover of history, then go to trhistorical.com. There you'll find apparel, drinkware, decor, and more featuring a wide range of interests from the ancient world to the Cold War. Looking to make an impression with the perfect gift? Well, TR Historical now offers gift cards and a vintage wrapping service for a truly unique presentation. And our listeners will receive 10% off plus free shipping in the U.S. when you use promo code GBERG1863. So go to trhistorical.com, TR Historical, for the love of history. You've heard us promote various ways that you can help us keep the show going, but one way we haven't pushed too much is our sutlery at AddressingGettysburg.com slash shop. That's a shame because we have designs over there by talented artists like Ty DeWitt of 1863 Designs and Mike Stretch of the Heritage Depot. So now we're promoting it. Buying shirts, hoodies, mugs, and other items from our sutlery not only helps us keep the lights on, but it also helps guys like Ty and Mike, and it helps spread the word about the show every time you wear an item or you sip from your mug. So head over to AddressingGettysburg.com slash shop and grab some merch. It's the perfect Christmas gift for the Gettys nerd in your family. That's AddressingGettysburg.com slash shop. Hey, Gettysburg business owners. Winter is just around the bend, and you know what that means. No tourists. But just because people aren't coming to you doesn't mean you can't bring your business to them. If you ship, you're still in the game. And if you're a seasonal business, the time to advertise for your next season is in the off-season when people are making their plans. So what's an affordable yet highly effective way of reaching those people? Well, it's not radio, it's not TV, and it's certainly not print. Step out of the Jurassic era of advertising and run an ad on Addressing Gettysburg. We just reached 1 million downloads and we're growing by the tens of thousands every month. Beyond that, our audience is happy to support those who support their favorite podcast. So email sales at addressing Gettysburg for more information about advertising on our show. We look forward to helping your business grow. That's sales at addressing Gettysburg.com. You're listening to the Addressing Gettysburg podcast with Matt Callery. Okay, and we are back now with Rick Schrader. We're talking about union officer wounds here, and we have questions from our patrons. They're submitted by our awesome patrons over at patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg. If you'd like to submit questions for our guides to answer, then, uh, you know, uh, you got to be a patron. That's just how it goes. That's the deal that we've made with you. You have to be a patron in order to do that. So go to patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg. The more you patronize, the more we can do. So hop on board. It's a lot of fun over there. Mike, you're a patron. Oh, absolutely. Lifelong patron for the <laughs> life of our Patreon account. Right? <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and uh, we have a lot of stuff that over there, right? Oh, absolutely. Of- All sorts of content that you don't get on the free feed that is absolutely fantastic. Yeah. It's uh, it's almost. I almost feel like I'm I'm uh, I'm cheating the free listeners out of stuff. <laughs> but then I realized that I'm not because they're getting it for free. Oh, yeah, right. So, like, they're like getting a lot of content over there as well. Yeah, but, I mean, yeah. it's just yeah, the no. depth of content on on Patreon is just that's what it is incredible. on Patreon. Is yeah. you get more. We're just wetting your whistle on the free feed, but yeah. you're really getting deep into things and and we cover everything. Yeah, love. <laughs> Medical rights of retaliation. Rights of retaliation. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we really do. We cover like all this stuff, and it's not just Gettysburg. Gettysburg, as we say, is the gateway drug to the Civil War, and so we explore the Civil War through the lens of Gettysburg. There, um, and then also, I should mention that uh, Rick, you brought your son Brad along. Brad mm-hmm. is studying to be a doctor. You're studying, or you're a resident? Yeah. Yeah, you're a resident. Yep. And uh, obstructionist. 
Ob- obstetrician. Obstetrician. In his younger life, he might have been an obstructionist, but that hasn't been a problem in a long time. Very good. So I that's don't nice. Think he was the worst obstructionist. <laughs> but that's nice, though. You you're going to uh, you're in a profession now where you're you're bringing uh, life into the world. Yeah. Uh, it's a joyful occasion. That's nice, right? Of course, there are complications that could make it sad and scary, but for the most part, it's a happy thing, right? Very good. You married? Yes. You are. Okay, good. You have kids? Uh, yeah. Not yet. You're not going to want to have dog. kids, though, are you? <laughs> it's like, do I want to go home and cook a burger when I work at McDonald's all day? I'm not the one. I'm not the one that's going to be delivering it. That's true. That's a good. Point. <laughs> that's a good point. Okay. All right. Well, welcome, welcome to the show. Uh, all right, we're going to start here. We got a bunch of questions, so we're going to start here with uh, Tom Plefka. He says, several years ago, we took a tour of the battlefield with an LBG, and on the tour, the guy drove us by a house on the backside of Little Round Top and told us that was the home they took Strong Vincent to. After after he was wounded. I was curious as to what his wounds were and where he was taken to after he was treated at this home. So there's a little error in here. Yeah, um, I, I mentioned this during the, the, um, the context of the presentation. There were high-ranking officers taken to the Jacob Weikert farm uh, directly on the backside of Little Round Top, but uh, Colonel Strong Vincent wasn't one of them. He went to a Fifth Corps hospital in um, not the Bushman farm that we know of on the battlefield, but another uh, Bushman farm uh, over on Hospital Road, and that's where he died. And that's across the street from my friend's house. Oh, is it? Yeah, yeah. it's beautiful over there. Oh, that's the, the, very nice. You know, there's there's monument after monument after monument of all these Union hospitals over there, yeah. and the road is aptly named Hospital Road. Yep. Um, we're going to think we seem to be a little um, scrotal-centric in this talk, but Strong Vincent was shot in the testicles. Another it, one. Yes, he was. Good and um, uh, again, we tend to say the lower abdomen because it just seems more um, appropriate. Polite. Yeah. But, you know, you can picture him standing on that rock right next to the castle like 44th New York where there's an etching about where he was wounded I mean, he's trying to to keep the 16th Michigan up there and the 140th New York is coming in on his right and he's urging his men you know don't don't give an inch don't give an inch and and he gets shot in the cojones <laughs> Jeez. not well, a good thing and he had big ones apparently well, apparently because For... he he had he, he had the balls to disobey orders and right. go up there right um, and he's not a professional soldier so I would agree with your assessment, man. I think he had big cojones. Yeah. Um, okay. So now, so that was his, and, and he was treated over on Hospital Road at the Bushman Farm. That's there. what I understand. Okay. So that's it. But he's thinking of weed instead of who was taken to the um, I think Weikert so. House. Weed, Hazlitt, and um, O'Rourke, O'Rourke. Are at the Jacob Weikert House on Tawny Town Road. Okay. Tom Young says, did anyone else take an amputated limb home with them like sickles, maybe for religious reasons, question mark? Um, Not that I'm aware of. We talked a little bit before the recording, and Mike brought up um, an occurrence of a gentleman wounded at another battle that took his leg off, if you want to tell that story, Mike. As one of the scouts for Stewart at Brandy Station, uh, he'd have his leg blown off. Um, and of course, when he's put into the stretcher, he's like, get my leg. It's been such a faithful companion to me for so long, I don't want to part with it. <laughs> so, yeah. and another, I don't want to part with my leg either. An interesting part of that story in association with Butler is um, Wade Hampton's brother, Frank Hampton, is killed uh, in that same action down near Stevensburg. Mm-hmm. And Frank Hampton's daughter goes on to work in an operating room in Baltimore, and her hands get all irritated from the carbolic acid solution that they're operating under. Now they're figuring out how to prevent infection. So this surgical resident uh, who's got the sweets for um, young Ms. Hampton invents gloves to protect her hands, um, and it becomes the the initial uh, type of surgical glove used in the operating room. Huh. So they were used to protect the there operators are, yes. more than the patient back then. Yeah. And that surgeon was a guy named William Halstead, who was like one of the most famous surgeons in the history of the United States, down at Hopkins. So now we're talking about gloves. Um, we, so, you know, you guys wash your hands before you go into surgery, right? Yes. And your forearms and all yes. that stuff, right? Yes. Then you put the gloves on. Yes. 
Well, my question is, what's the difference? Like, what, what, are the, what are the gloves doing that washing your hands didn't do? Well, it's a barrier between your skin and the patient. So, like, you don't accidentally cut yourself and bleed into the patient? Right. Or, or no matter how much we scrub our hands and forearms, we can't get rid of all the bacteria on our skin. Right. And so many surgeons, myself included, um, the last 10 or 15 years I worked, I didn't really scrub my arms uh, uh, much after the first operation, I applied a uh, uh, iodine. A, well, it was a foam that had a lot of uh, bacterial, antibacterial agents in it, Interesting. and it, it it adhered to your skin, and so it, it was actually better at decreasing bacteria on your own skin than scrubbing was. Huh. And so, but we still use gloves, and you know. It, if you worked for more than 20 or 30 minutes, it was likely that you would get a hole in a glove, so we were quick to change our gloves as needed. Ethan Gallo has two questions. We're going to call him Two Questions Gallo soon if he doesn't, uh, <laughs> if he doesn't stop. Uh, okay. Could you please give a comprehensive description of the wounds received by Alonzo Cushing and his emotional and physical disposition after being wounded on the uh, 3rd of July. I think we talked a good bit about that. He incurs three injuries. The third one kills him. The second one wishes that he had died, I'm sure, when he got shot in the testicles and he'd been shot in the shoulder. But he he, he maintained his position and um, more than appropriately was uh, in 2014 was awarded the Medal of Honor for yeah. his actions. Long, long overdue, I think. I agree. Uh, question two, where exactly on the head slash upper torso was John Reynolds hit and was his death instantaneous? Covered that one as well. Yeah, right. Either in the head or the back of the neck, but either way, he, he wouldn't have lived more than seconds. Now, this one here, ladies and gentlemen, um, <laughs> I, when this person became a patron, you know, I get a notification that says, you know, so-and-so has become a patron. And then I immediately go in and I thank them. I send them a thank you uh, email. And when this one came through, I, I mean, I don't know, but I have to believe this is a made-up name. Um, and I wrote the person and I said, that is the greatest name ever. Uh, and then when you send a question in as a patron, you send it to an email address that uh, Dave Bussier runs, and he takes them and he puts them into a Google Doc for me, and that's what I read off of. And so sometimes he puts notes. So this is how it is written. Jortney Fartwagon. <laughs> in parentheses, I swear that's what it says. Close parentheses. <laughs> Jortney wants to know, the recovery from Hancock's wound sounds excruciating. I once read that the groin wound he received on the 3rd of July was still expelling shards of shrapnel as late as the Overland campaign, and that he struggled with pain on horseback, so had to travel mostly by ambulance in May and June of 1864. Is this true? Youch, man. Thank you, Jortney Fartwagon. <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of less speechless in answering Mr. Fartwagon, but... Uh... I, I think Mr. we. How I, do you know it's a Mr. Jordany? What? what it's yeah, a, yeah. It It sounds Maybe like Courtney. Maybe it's a Ms. Fartwagon. Yeah, M Madam Fartwagon. <laughs> um, but I think that, uh, uh, nevertheless, um, person Fartwagon, we did discuss uh, uh, a good bit of this in the content of the of the talk. Um, uh, as we talked about, Hancock's wound was severe. I think I think he probably had an open wound there for the rest of his life because I I think he got a bone infection well established there, but it. It, as uh, as either Mike or Matt pointed out, I mean, he didn't seem to do a lot of sitting uh, after yeah, after pointer. his after his wound. Uh, Did, w w was something like that that kind of a wound with the the sinus mm -hmm. there? And I guess when I was asking you the question about the cyst, is that a sinus that when a cyst leaks? Um, the difference between a, a cyst is a fluid filled collection of pus or fluid or whatever. Grossness, yeah. uh, a sinus is um, uh, an opening with a blind pouch at the end of it. So could a cyst turn into a sinus? It could. That's what I'm asking. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So, um, but so the sinus that that's, would it ever close and then like, or is it possible that it could close and then reopen? Yes. It, it's and, not constant, right? Um, usually not. But when it 
does close, that's when the patient becomes sicker because now all of that stuff that should be expelled right. and not make him have a fever and not make him have a pain and not make him develop an abscess, he's going to feel a lot better when that sinus is opened. Okay. And so um, as, as distasteful as it is to say I'd rather have stuff coming out of my ischial tuberosity, you're going to feel better if you have that. Yeah, no, and, and I think anybody would agree that your ischial tuberosity is you know, it, I, I think that just it feels for good. It feels good to have to have your ischial tuberosity leaking. You know, you want to have it leak because well, you don't want that building leak, up. You'd rather have it coming out than going in. Absolutely, <laughs> you don't want it leaking into you. No. Uh, Naptown Bob. I'm no. liking the names of these people. Jordany Fartwagon, Naptown Bob. From Indianapolis. That's yeah. Naptown. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, that's, I don't, his real name is a Naptown Pop. Sure. <laughs> uh, I was recently reading somewhere, excuse my addled memory as to where, that at Meade's Council of War, G.K. Warren was lying down after his neck wound. Was his wound this serious or was he milking it a bit? Oh, Naptown Bob. <laughs> Be, be kind to G.K. Warren. Let me give you a third option, and then, Rick, you tell me what you think it is. Uh, Warren was tired. Yeah. All right. Yeah, so which he, one? He'd done a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Which one would you say it is? I think his, he's uh, got a pretty superficial, almost a deep scratch. He had a bandage on it. Um, but I think the fact that he fell asleep during the uh, Council of War had more to do with how fatigued and tired he was after doing some stuff that day to save that ill called little round top. I don't think his wound was very serious. Now, however, I mean, a, a deep scratch, right? What was it, a grazing wound? Is that, that what it was? That would be my understanding, yeah. yeah. So a deep scratch, um, I, there was a time I had a deep cut on my finger, right? And it was bleeding. Like, actually, I had to go to the ER because it wouldn't stop bleeding. Mm-hmm. And it was, like, pretty <clears throat> pretty deep. I didn't pass out, but I was, I was kind of drained the rest of that day. Like, I fell out of it. And then there was another time <laughs> I was, you know how you can skim seashells and stones? Oh, sure, you know? yeah, yeah. So I'm in the, in the ocean. It's low tide. I'm, like, I don't know, 12, 13 years old. And uh, my buddy's skimming shells. And I'm out in the, in the water a little bit. And, you know, they're coming near. And I'm like, hey, man, be careful. You know, I'm out here. You're skimming the sh-. And he thought it was funny. <laughs> and so he continues skimming the shells. I'm under the water good, and swimming around. Is a good friend? Not anymore. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> I go under the water. I come up. And I just feel this whack on my head, right? And I have no idea what it is. And it actually, like, knocks me back. And I go under the water. And then I come up. And my friends there are cracking up until, and then all of a sudden he goes, oh, and because there was blood cascading down my face and chest. And I looked down and I see it on my chest and I was like, oh, what the hell? And he had, he had cut, um, right here it was, and and it had, it just made a nice little cut on my head. And the rest of that day I was out of it. Now I I also got hit in the head. Right, right. But I I was not uh, feeling too well that day. So I, it's a minor thing compared to like losing your arm. Right. 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 It's not a huge trauma, but it is still something that the body has to deal with. It it does. But I think that, um, your description of your finger wound, and if we talk about Warren's neck wound, it's unlikely in those wounds that you lost enough blood to affect um, whether you were going to be sleepy or not. That that probably has as much to do with emotional fatigue as anything okay, else. Okay, there you now, go. Now, the one you described where your, your best friend slit your head open with a <laughs> seashell, um, scalp wounds are notoriously bloody, um, yes. uh, and they bleed a lot. Yeah. You could lose enough blood to... to to, um, potentially die from a scalp wound. In theory, although it, it, if somebody just puts their hand on it, it'll stop the bleeding. Right. So yeah. Yeah. No, I cut myself shaving quite often. This white yeah. spot on the top here is from that, and uh, this one was a real bleeder. Yeah. Uh, it bleeds, man. They, you got. They really do. I have this stuff called bleed stop. Yeah. yeah. I keep it at home. It's very handy to have, especially if you're bald and you shave your head. Yeah, Stephen, L- Stephen Lunsford says, it seems there were quite a few horse-related injuries by Union commanders at Gettysburg uh, where they f- either fell or got knocked off their mounts. The ones that come to mind are Solomon Meredith, Thomas Rowley, and Vladimir Shrizanovsky. Shizanowski. Krizanowski, as you know, anybody who Chris. with eyes would see a Kriz, as we like to call him. Uh, I know there are probably more, but all three of those gents just seem to disappear from everything after their respective falls, especially Krizanowski. Some of the only info I have found 
was that he was knocked off his horse, but uncertain if he returned to combat. Uh, but I'm uncertain if they turn to come out. La, 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 la. And there's the whole was Riley w- wounded or drunk debate. I was wondering if you had any anecdotes or other details on any of the accidental officer injuries at Gettysburg. Well, the um, of the three people we mentioned, I'm not aware that I can um, relate anything else about Solomon Meredith. Um, Thomas Riley is... is most of your listeners know the issue was, did he have boils on his butt? Was he drunk or did he have a equestrian injury? Um, uh, there were people in his court-martial uh, that said he never drank. So, I mean, he, maybe he was he had boils on his butt so sore that he, he commanded poorly. That's a little bit of a stretch for me to understand. I have read accounts that describe what happens to uh, uh, um, Shishinowski in that in the injury from the horse, he injured his chest and he may have actually had a pneumothorax or a collapsed lung because he couldn't take his breath very deeply. He was present and commanding up on Cemetery Hill on day two and day three. Um, but uh, I think he describes uh, a significant amount of uh, shortness of breath after his his fall from the horse. So, with you, can you survive a collapsed lung yeah, without help? You can, and if you developed a collapsed lung in the Civil War, it would heal itself, and then your lung would eventually re-expand. But it was there was no way to re-expand the lung like we would now, where we would put a chest tube in and pull a vacuum and it would re-expand your lung. That wasn't possible to do back in the Civil War. Right. That's fascinating. Uh, Jessica Files says, almost 10 years ago, I utilized an LBG for the first time when, li- when visiting Gettysburg. Loved it. The LBG said Louis Armistead's wound was survivable if it hadn't been for his diabetes. I've never read that nor heard anyone else say that. Any truth to that? Yeah, I've never read that or heard that either. How about no. you? I think the most important response to so this person is to say that, yeah, the LBGs are the greatest thing on the, on the battlefield. <laughs> uh, I agree with that. I have not encountered anything that led me to believe that Armistead had diabetes. But I do strongly believe that Armistead's wounds were survivable. Neither one in the right forearm or the left calf was a life-threatening injury. And I think I've said this maybe on this show. He's taken to the George Spangler farm. He's 47 years old. He's dehydrated. He doesn't move very much, and he dies very suddenly. And I would say there's really most likely a sudden blood clot to the lungs or what we call a pulmonary embolism probably killed him uh, uh, when he died uh, unexpectedly. When you read about his death, and and the best book to read about that in is in um, uh, Ron— Ron's book, uh, Too Much for Human Endurance. Uh, Ron Kirkwood. Ron Kirkwood, thank you. Um, There are people who describe an undiagnosed chest uh, wound. I don't think that goes undiagnosed for very long. Right. um, I I tend to believe the lesser injuries and then the subsequent sudden death from a blood clot. Terry Bungie says, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, Terry. It's the first time I'm seeing your name uh, and having to speak it. Uh, My question is, as I understand it, after Vincent's brigade had arrived on Little Round Top, three companies and the color guard of the 16th Michigan Infantry retreated further up Little Round Top without orders, causing Strong Vincent to come over to rally the 16th Michigan back to their position, which resulted in in Vincent's mortal wounding. Are there any records or accounts of the other regiments in Vincent's brigade harboring ill feelings towards the 16th Michigan because of Vincent's death? Um, I think all of that's accurate, but I don't know of people writing uh, and damning the 16th Michigan. Um, The 140th New York would have come in on their right um, and they were plugging a hole there. I suppose if somebody was upset about it, they would have written about it. Maybe it exists and I'm just not aware. But I'm not aware of the 44th New York, which would have been on their left. Um, uh, Mike, have, have you ever read anything about that? I've never read anything in post-war accounts where yeah. they're criticizing the 16th Michigan. Yeah. That sounds like... Uh, I, I wonder why. I wonder if he, if he was... If he's thinking of something there with that question or if he's just wondering because that's what we tend to do is blame people for well, Yeah, yeah. This never would have happened if you would have done this. <laughs> right, exactly. Right. Brian Derenick says, can Rick talk about the wound suffered by Brigadier General Gabriel Paul on July 1st and how the wound was not fatal? Yeah. 
Yeah, he was what through the eyes, right? Yeah, he was shot. Um, I don't remember which side it went in. I think it was the right. It went right behind his right eye, Ugh. straight across oh. the oh. face, and out from behind the left eye. Oh. So why doesn't he die from this? Because it doesn't hit his brain. It's in front of the brain. And so it wipes out the nerves to both eyes. He's instantly blinded. He does go on to have some medical issues like convulsions afterwards. But if I'm not mistaken, he survives at least five or six years after that uh, that. Uh, instant wound that blinded him. Well, you know, so you, convulsions you mentioned, and that made me think of, you know, head or brain trauma, I guess. Um, you, you get shot in the head and survive. Mm -hmm. Whether it's a spent ball or, in his case, it doesn't hit anything vital, it just rips out your eyes, basically. Um, there's also... <clears throat> I'm imagining that you're getting a concussion, too. Oh, no doubt about it, because the force of that injury is going to rattle your brain yeah. significantly. And, um, you know, even if you don't get a gunshot wound to the head, let's say you're, you're concussed in Devil's Den just because of all the vibration of artillery shells there— could that end up leaving you with uh, with convulsions or seizures afterwards? Yeah, it could. Yeah. Um, but the more damage to the brain, the more likely those things are going to to occur. That makes sense. Yeah. Uh, and finally, our listener of the year of 2022, Estella Beard, she yeah. says, were doctors, when under the pressure of many, many wounded at one time, really able to assess each patient carefully to consider the best course of treatment for them? I feel as if maybe fewer amputations would have been a necessity if they had more time. What do you think about that? And that's a really good question. And, of course, Estella, you're asking a doctor, do I think doctors made the right decision? <laughs> um, sure. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I think that the the experienced surgeons, and nothing but time gives you experience, uh, realize um, pretty quickly what needs to be done. Um, doing a with an extremity injury, you basically have two choices: you can do a resection and save the limb, remove the damaged parts of the bone and the muscle, but save the limb, or you can do an amputation. A resection takes longer. It leaves the limb behind to get infected, and um, uh, time is of the essence in triaging these uh, and taking care of these men. So Jonathan Letterman, the medical director for Meade's Army of the Potomac, was actually critical of his medical staff that they didn't do enough amputations at Gettysburg, that they shouldn't have done as many, and they didn't do many, hmm. but still shouldn't have done as many resections as they did. I think that— uh, should have or shouldn't have done They as should many. not have done as many resections as they and did. And just amputated. Yes, because it was um, faster, uh, and it was probably a more predictable result when all the mm. dust settled. Um, and I think the main thing is just the efficiency of getting the wounded taken care of so they could move on to the next. Now, you know, in this day and age, I mean, obviously in my, my profession, our job was to figure out ways to put these back together. But we have plates, screws, rods, uh, yeah, x-ray. I, I mean, they didn't have any of no. that, and let alone anesthesia and antibiotics, obviously a very different world. But um, I think that the, the decision to proceed with amputation was largely done based on what was in front of them. And some people would suggest that the officers maybe got preferential treatment. And when you look at John Bell Hood's injury, although it, it really wasn't all that serious, um, but I have a feeling that most of the decisions were made based on what was in front of the surgeons. If, if I have a resection, let's say I get shot in the shin. Okay. My tibula, is that right? Your tibia. Tibia? Tibia. Tibia. Can't they just come up with normal names for these things? <laughs> then you'd know what we were talking about. <laughs> God forbid. So I get shot in my shin, mm -hmm. and uh, they they, are, they do a resection instead of an amputation. Mm -hmm. Do they put something in there to fill that space? I mean, they'd have to, right? If, if, if back then, I mean, not oh, back today. Then? Yeah. Um, no, they don't have anything to put in there, and so well, then take the leg. And so, what good is it? The that really became a problem if you did a resection in the femur, the thigh bone. Yeah. Some in the tibia, but you've 
I think most people who've looked at photographs from the Civil War have seen these pictures of guys standing um, on four-inch blocks of wood because their leg is so short. Mm. Uh, most of the time, if you had an x-ray, you might see that the fracture never healed, and they had what's called a non-union, where it's, there's a false joint in the middle of the bone, uh, because those bones are so badly damaged. Uh, while bones do tend to knit themselves together, if there's a lot of surrounding soft tissue damage, like in a gunshot wound, sure. that's less likely to occur. Mm -hmm. And so it's quite clear that in those instances, uh, you would be better off with a prosthesis than your own leg. Sure. And that's hard for people to understand, but um, it, it's really true. Yeah. Man, what a mess. What a mess that was. But uh, you helped us clear it up a little bit, Rick. Okay, thanks. It's still, it's still a mess, but I don't think there's anything anybody can do. Let me do one thing before we're done, if sure. I may. Um, I misspoke badly, mm. and as a oh, licensed yeah. battlefield guide, this would never do, but I got the stories between Colonel Paul Joseph Revere and Colonel George Ward mixed up, and my my friend Mike to the left of me uh, kindly led me down that road to to get that straight. So I apologize. Kindly, he called you an idiot. No, I not, I didn't hear that part. <laughs> Did you? Uh, no, but I apologize to the listeners. Uh, you expect more than that from yeah, guys. But that's good, though. Okay, well, thank you for uh, correcting us yes. on that. And. Um, well, that's about it, ladies and gentlemen. That's it for this one. We're going to have Rick back to do Confederate officers Great. and their wounds as well sometime. And, if, you know, I, these medical shows do uh, rather well. So if you're a fan of the medical shows and there's something that you want to hear us talk about, then let us know. And we'll see if we can get Rick and Fran to come on and, and do it. Or, yeah, or We'd be happy to. Either or, if not yeah. both. And uh, that's about it. So thanks for listening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, all of you who rushed out to become patrons right after I said you have to be a patron in order to uh, <laughs> ask a question. That was so kind of you. I saw all of, the, uh, all of the notifications coming in at once, and you are too wonderful. So that's it. Mike, thanks for sitting in. Thank you. And we'll talk to you all next time. All righty. Let's eat lunch. Are you a reenactor or living historian? Or maybe you're a War of Rights player and want to bring esprit de corps to your team. Well, then you need the Badge Maker, the leading provider of Civil War and other historical badges and insignias. Mention this ad with an attached message in your order and receive a free surprise gift. I myself bought a metal Second Corps badge, and it always starts a conversation when I wear it. So hit up the Badge Maker at CivilWarCorpsBadges.com. Something for everyone. And anyone. Our hearts so stout have got us fame for suit is known from whence we came. Wherever we go, they dread the name of Gary Owen and glory. Instead, it's follow, drink down and pay.